then it was eerily quiet. And then my mind was kind of like, you know, the head in the fishbowl. Then it takes me into the bathroom and says, this is how you brush your teeth. Brush, rinse, repeat, brush, rinse, repeat, brush, rinse, repeat. But there were two girls, and it was like, you'll have to give us a ride. You can't fill us, though. He can't refuse us. He'll let us in his car. The thoughts were all alone in this empty void. You know, the head in the fishbowl. This doesn't look right. They got close enough where he said he could see, you know, their eyes and, and how intelligent they seem. This doesn't look right. He's gremlin type creature. This doesn't look right. No pupils, no iris. Three fingers, three long fingers. And this is when the mental torture. And then, and then it was eerily quiet. Waiting for you to count us in. Sorry. Uh, it's all right. Me and Adam just had a moment. We were sitting across the room from each other, just staring at each other because he was waiting for me and I was waiting for him. Staring at each other awkwardly. <laughs> yeah, it was cool. Yeah, it happens. So how's it going, Rob? Good, man. How have you been? Been all right. How was your Thanksgiving? It was good. Good. Got to spend some time with my family. Went down to Chattanooga and did some, did some hiking, which was interesting. Nice. I went to this place uh, in Chattanooga on Lookout Mountain called Lula Lake. Which uh, only gets open like like twice every month. It's like owned privately, and uh, my dad was saying, telling me that it was going to be an easy hike. Well, it, it ended up being kind of arduous because <laughs> to get down to the falls, we took like the high adventure trail, and boy, was it ever the high adventure trail! At one point, man, it was so steep. That you had to like actually like there was like a rope tied to a tree and you had to bring yourself down on a rope. That was kind of cool. Yeah. Yeah, it was uh it was really cool, let me tell you that. Then I almost killed myself coming back up. <laughs> but it was pretty neat because there was like a on the steps coming back up, there's like an old car chassis. Cause people used to like steal cars and dump their cars in the lake there. Oh fun. and uh they've just got one sitting right there that's kind of like preserved. <laughs> so it's it was it was really kind of cool so yeah that's that's what we did hung out and uh hung out in, in in old chattanooga for a little while and i'll be back in christmas how about yourself i was Do you here. have any cats in the studio again no no cats uh just me and the fam lots of food way too much food cooked enough food for probably 20 people yeah Still have leftovers if you're hungry. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's uh, it's been it's been almost over a week now. Yeah, right? we, it's time to throw it all out. Yeah, it's probably true. <laughs> we ate most of it, honestly. Well, I mean, suffice to say, Luke isn't here. Um, that's not a big surprise. <laughs> no, Eventually, I think maybe around episode 200, I'll just start not announcing that he's here. Yeah. But he's Plus not here. Let, <laughs> get when he's here, when he's here, we'll just have to like introduce him. He's like, and this is our good friend Luke that none of you have ever heard. <laughs> I had one of our listeners actually go back and start listening to the old shows, like starting with like episode one, just so they could hear <laughs> Luke. Because <laughs> uh-huh. it's it's become such a rare it's become such a rare ap- appearance now. You know, his job is still kind of uh, taking him out of the out of the running and i keep telling him to get it changed back and he's like i don't know what to do man my girlfriend won't look so yeah but he did get his power cut off today so that 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 kind of sucks for him you gotta pay your power bill luke yeah (laughs) It's, it's an unfortunate part of living oh guys we've got an interesting show for you all tonight um we're gonna have like actually two guests uh, the first one is, uh, I think his name, Jason Fabok, Fabok, I think is his name. Uh, trying to learn how to pronounce some people's names. You never know. Right. So um, it's either Fabok or Fabok. Um, but he's a artist for DC Comics. And we're going to talk to him about some of his experiences with that. And he's got some personal experiences. He's actually a listener to the show. So it's really cool that... Uh, He's going to come on and talk to us tonight. And then after that, we're going to have Brian Godawa to come on and talk about his, his new book. So, um, there was something that I was go- going to talk about, but now I can't really remember what it was. I hate uh, it when that happens. It, it, it must've been something really, really important. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Cause yeah. 
Well, we can hit in the outro. Yeah, if I if I remember it, that is. <laughs> I'm getting old, man. You know, it's it's hard getting old. Your Wait, brain, you your brain, for. your brain starts to go. Yeah. Well, unfortunately, I didn't write it down in my notebook. But it is what it is. Okay, guys, uh, we'll be back with uh, Jason, and then later on with Brian on Conspiracy Normal. <laughs> You know, Rob, I have come full circle in life. Oh, yeah? <laughs> I have. Because when I was a kid, and I still have a box of them in my, in my apartment, but when I was a kid, my favorite comic book was Swamp Thing. Really? Yeah. It just was a, it just was a great series. Of course, you know, like Alan Moore eventually took it over. And that was some of the some of the classic stuff, classic horror comic book, and kind of like you know, still love Alan Moore stuff even to this day. You know, that would be somebody I'd love to get on the show. But I found out that we have a listener that works on with DC Comics and works on a Swamp Thing issue. And so I thought that was really cool that this person that we have, Jason Fabuck, is out here with us. Jason, welcome to Good Spirit Normal. Hey guys, thanks for having me. Absolutely, man. I mean, I think it's really cool that uh, I have someone out there that listens to my podcast that uh, is now illustrating one of my favorite comic book characters. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've I've been listening to this podcast. I don't know. I found I found out from you guys through uh, Canary Cry Radio. Okay. They had yeah. meant, they had mentioned the podcast once, and then I went back and I started. I think I've listened to every single podcast you guys have done. Like I went back right to the beginning. At yeah. that at that point at that point you guys were I don't know how far along you were. Maybe it. What what episode is this? Uh, this will be one ninety. Okay, so I I think I was I started listening around like seventy or eighty. Uh, okay. So I've been listening for a while and I really, I've really always loved this podcast and, uh, I, I, you guys have opened my mind, guys have opened my mind and changed my, changed my opinions on a lot of different things. And, uh, awesome. You know, it's, it's been really, really great. You you actually know what Luke sounds like. (laughs) (laughs) I love that guy. (laughs) Unfortunately, guess what? He's not here, but, uh, you know, as, as usual. But that's that seems to be like his like his non presence has become a uh, has become a joke on the show now you know <laughs> so we just we're we're just gonna we we were thinking about putting up like a soundboard or like a Luke soundboard from all the old shows <laughs> and just having a response that'd be which, great which which most would uh, would uh, consist of me asking Luke what he thinks and then just deferring it to them him deferring it to Rob. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, man. Rob? Uh, what do you think, dude? <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, bro. I was asleep. <laughs> Not Rob, but uh, Luke being asleep. But yeah, what were some of your favorite episodes? Like, were you some of the favorite guests or some of the f- favorite things that we've talked about on the show? I'm just curious well, from uh, a listener's uh, standpoint. Yeah, well, I always love it when you have Dr. Future. Cause mm-hmm. I was a big, I was a big future quake. Oh, okay, but, cool. But well, I, like I listened to future quake, all the reruns. Cause I, I don't think when, when I started listening to future quake, it was already, it, he had already kind of stopped, Yeah. but I, I think I went through and listened to every future quake episode uh, at one time. Like when I, when I'm doing my work, I have lots of time to kind of sit there and listen to podcasts or watch documentaries and stuff like that. So sure. uh, that's us- that's usually what I do is I, I have my list of podcasts that I, that I just go through and uh, <clears throat> hit them up. Um, I, lo- I like uh, when uh, Joshua Cutchins comes on. Okay. Uh, I, I like a lot of the stuff he talks about. I, I like, you know, being a Christian myself, I like a lot of the, 
I like it when you guys explore, you know, things that you can, that kind of go with, with, you know, biblical kind of themes. But I, I like the, you know, I like, I like the episodes when you're talking about like UFOs and whatnot, but you know, is it, you know, from a biblical angle, um, you know, that kind of a thing, or again, I, I, I've, I've kind of followed, I've, I've changed my mind about a lot of things like the, the, um, you know, your, your whole, the whole theory that, you know, UFOs aren't actually space aliens from, you know, another galaxy, but instead there's some sort of a spiritual being, Sure. you know, uh, you know, I, I always, my dad always kind of thought that way, even, you know, even when I was a kid. And so I, I remember him telling me these kinds of things, but like listening to your show has really kind of helped me to, you know, explore some different ideas and, uh, and see things in a different light that I, that I didn't, you know, that I was kind of in a, in a bubble, in a box, uh, always just thinking everything from, you know, kind of a, you know, a traditional Christian worldview yeah. <laughs> kind, of, kind of thing. And then, you know, this has really helped me expand it. And I think because of that, it's actually helped me appreciate uh, things that are in the Bible even more, you know, sure. and, see, and see them from a different kind of angle and an angle that kind of makes a lot more sense in some ways. So, um, yeah, just off the top of my head, though, you know, I, I don't know. I've I've loved a lot of the different. Uh, I like the 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 cin- cinema symbolism episodes are really great mm. too. Yeah, uh, those are fascinating. Uh, Robert W. Sullivan the fourth, he's a fascinating guy. This, this mm-hmm. uh, the guy he he has such a wealth of knowledge of like Freemasonry and then also of kind of like the the occult stuff as well, which I which I mm-hmm. find which I find fascinating. So. But is any of that kind of like the, the uh, any of these kind of themes like inspire any of your work from, you know, while you're like while you're drawing and, and creating? Um, yeah, it, I, I've, I've thrown out different things sometimes at writers like, you know, when I was well, for example. All right. So I, I was going back and I was listening to I forget I forget where it was, but uh, there's a classic there's a classic coast to coast episode or a bunch of episodes or interviews called uh, Mel's hole. Yeah. <laughs> and, and it's, it's hilarious. And I, and I remember listening to that while I was working on justice league. And I remember it was, I listened to it. The, it was the day that the, the writer ended up calling me, we were discussing ideas and I was laughing so hard at these Mel's hole, like the whole idea of it actually being real. And I kind of told them this whole thing. Well, there's like this bottomless pit and there's a hole and everything they put into it, you know, just disappears. And then the next <laughs> thing I know, the next script I get, he writes, he actually writes in like a hole, <laughs> this giant uh, uh-huh. pit hole where, where Green Lantern and I think Batman have to go down this or the, I forget what it was now. It's been a while, but it was something like one of the bad guys they went to like where he was born yeah, somewhere out in like some dimension. And it was like this big hole. And so I, I had a good laugh because he actually like, he listened to me and <laughs> he ended up putting that story kind of in some way into the book. Um, but there's, a, there's a lot of little things like that. Sometimes I'll, I'll toss out and, um, and you know, uh, you know, things about like MK ultra and whatnot. Yeah or some different storylines, but, uh, it all just depends on if you got a writer who's really, who's willing to kind of listen to you and doesn't think you're crazy. You know, I think a lot of these ideas that are coming up on these podcasts and kind of like the, uh, more in more mainstream shows like coast to coast. Um, I think a lot of people are listening to these shows and they're, and they're picking up these ideas about conspiracies, about, supernatural i mean a good case in point would be stranger things oh yeah because that you know has to do with a lot that at least the first season had to do a lot with mk ultra and some of the stuff about the montauk surrounding like the montauk project and and those type of ideas so i think these things like kind of cr- cross pollinate and mm-hmm. I, I really i seriously think that there are script writers and comic book writers and uh, all kinds of people that are listening to these shows and, and pulling a lot, putting a lot of these ideas in their fiction. Yeah, that's true. And I mean, it, it makes for good, it makes for even better stories. So, you know, why not, um, you know, kind of thing. Uh, but yeah, I think, uh, you know, a lot of those, a lot of those things have inspired me and it always, even going back to like when I was a kid, I've always been interested in, 
you know, UFOs and, uh, you know, spiritual dimensions, book of revelation kind of things. And, uh, Bigfoot, uh, you know, I've been a, mm. big in the Bigfoot and, and dinosaurs and all kinds of like, you know, cryptozoological things. And I think a lot of that, you know, was spurred on because of my imagination. Like even as a kid, I always had just an overactive imagination to the point where I could scare myself into thinking that something was actually real or, or there, you know? Yeah. Um, and I just think that that's something that, you know, I, I, as an art artsy kind of person, I just, I don't, I think, I think I have a little bit of a free thinking when it comes to those things. And I, and I, uh, I'm able, uh, I've always just been able to kind of, you know, see possibilities, you know, whereas I, other people would say, well, this stuff's crazy. I kind of say, well, I don't know. <laughs> you know, if you look at this evidence and you look at these people who are given their eyewitness accounts, I mean, I don't know, I, you know, something's going on. I don't know. Nobody really knows what it is, but right. something, something is going on. Right. Yeah. And, that's, that's the one thing that we absolutely know for sure. Whether we're talking about UFOs or we're talking about Bigfoot sightings or anything like that, we know something is happening. Mm -hmm. But it's like the there there are people that get really dogmatic about a lot of this stuff and say, no, it has to be this or it has to be that. And I'm sitting here just like, it doesn't have to be any of that. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Agreed. So you were you were wanted to talk a little bit about like a personal experience that you had. Um, I guess yeah. there's something happened when you were growing up. Yeah. So let's see if I can kind of get the story straight. Um, it has to do with, it has to do, and I, I think you guys have talked about some of this stuff on the show before. I'm sure you have, but it kind of has to do with like a, a shadow entity. Um, and so I'll kind of set up the story. So I think, I think I was around 19 years old at this time. I'm, I'm still, or maybe it might even be in, been a little earlier. Um, I was still living at home. I think I was going to college and, and then my college was local. So I would just drive in and one night I'm sleeping in my bed and all of a sudden I remember waking up and the light in my room just came on and I was kind of, I remember kind of feeling like I didn't really know I was in a dream state. It, it seemed like it was, everything was real, but uh, I can't hundred percent say for sure if I was in a dream state or not, but uh, standing above my bed, looking down at me, the lights on so I can see this thing as clear as I possibly could was this shadow being. And the only way I can really describe it is it was like as if you took a, a, a man's body and a man was standing there and you took like a, uh, a black um, curtain or a black blanket and draped oh. it over this thing's body. So it was, it was like as if it had a curtain or like, it kind of looked like a Nazgul, you know, the ring race or okay. like, uh, or like a Dementor from Harry Potter, but no, but no detail. It was just like, as if it was just a black blanket draped over a human body. Mm. And it was just staring at me, <clears throat> looking at me and staring at me. And I remember, I do remember feeling terrified. And I remember pulling the covers over my head um, and it was just like I had it was just like a blanket that I pulled over my head, like a sheet. So it was kind of thin. And so even though the sheet was above my head, I could still see through because the light was shining. I could still kind of see through the sheet and still saw like the outline of the shadow. But what was really odd about the whole thing was then all of a sudden the light just went out and I fell right back to sleep immediately. Um, <clears throat> so then the next morning. I asked my mom, I said, because my mom used to, she would get up early for work. And so she, if she knew I had school the next day, the, the way to wake me up was she would just walk into my room and turn on my light. And, and, and you know, I would just naturally kind of stumble out of bed. So I went to her and I said, were you in my room? Like, did you go into my room? Did you turn on the light? You know, last night? She said, no. And I was like, well, so then I kind of told her the story. I said, well, there was like, I saw this thing in my room. It was like looking at me. Hmm. Um, <clears throat> now the, the thing about that time in my life is I, you know, I wasn't, um, even though I said I was a Christian, I really wasn't, <laughs> I really wasn't, I wasn't following anything that I believed. And, um, it was very soon after that point that I kind of had 
like a conversion experience that was supernatural and kind of changed my whole trajectory of my life and changed everything at the same time, like a week after my parent, after my conversion, uh, my, my parents got told me they were getting a divorce. Ugh. Um, so there was like all this kind of like negative stuff. The, 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 the scary part of this story is, is that it was about three or four years later, my dad was driving me. I was, I was actually at this point in time in my life, I was going to this, uh, I was, uh, attending the small little Bible college up in Northern Ontario and it was at Christmas break. And my dad, I needed a ride back up because it was about six hours North up in Owen Sound, Ontario. And so my dad's given me a ride up and he says to me, you remember, remember how, like, remember like a few years back, you told me this story about this shadow person in your room. And I said, yeah, yeah, it was really scary. He said, I never told you this. He said, the same thing happened to me the same night. Oh. So he says that his story was that he was sleeping in his bed and all of a sudden the light didn't go. I, from what I remember, the light didn't go on his room, but he just woke up and looked at the foot of the bed and that standing at the foot of the bed was the same thing. Only this time in, instead he said that the, the thing raised its hand and just pointed at my dad, Ugh. pointed at him. And my dad said, again, he, like, he was so terrified. He pulled the sheets over and was just like praying, you know, like, like to God, like take this thing away or whatever. And he ended up telling my mom that story. And then I'm telling my mom that story. And my mom ended up telling my dad, don't, don't mention this to Jay. It will freak him out. Like it'll really freak him out. Like, I don't know what, like, like what's going on here kind of thing. Um, <clears throat> but it was just kind of like, it was cre creepy to know that like the same night that I had that happen, my dad had the same thing happen to him. And uh, yeah, like, I, I don't know. I, I've, and I've heard similar stories to that. I used to listen to a local uh, radio state, Christian radio station with this guy who used to do like apologetics and stuff. And, he told a similar story that his like his daughter his like his like eighteen year old daughter had passed away um, when she was you know when she was eighteen or nineteen or something like that and there, she he told a story that when his daughter was at camp one of his daughter's friends walked into uh, one of the uh, the bunk or whatever that her his daughter was sleeping in and said that she saw a shadow figure standing over her, <laughs> this guy's daughter. Ugh. And and then and then she ended up passing away not too long after. And I remember calling into that show because he said, has anybody ever ha had this experience? You know, and so I ended up calling in and telling my story. And he was kind of like he was kind of like freaked out because I was like the only one. There's all these people calling in and just kind of like, I don't know, telling their two cents of what they thought it was. I was like the only one who called in and actually said, yeah, I had the exact same experience. But, I, you know, I didn't die, <laughs> you know. But uh, I don't know. I, I I wonder if I wonder if it, again, like now, I don't know if you guys could had had any insight on that. Well, I know that there's a lot of um, uh, like Grim Reaper esque sort of sightings that go out there. I, I always wonder if it's sort of a, you know, that that image has been kind of ingrained into our our subconscious. You know. It's something that we all would naturally be afraid of or uh, would kind of project in moments of fear. Or if it's something that, you know, is the other way around, like it's been happening throughout all of history and that's how it's worked its way into our culture. But either way, yeah, I don't think it's really that super uncommon. Yeah, you hear a lot about these reports. I mean, there's a movie on Netflix called The Nightmare. I don't know if you've seen this or not, but it's a it's a no. documentary actually, and it's probably one of the scarier documentaries ever made. And it talks a lot about sleep paralysis experiences, and a lot of it has to do with these shadow these shadow people experiences. And when you had that happen to you, were you paralyzed, or was it just like you woke up and you just saw it? Yeah, I don't remember being paralyzed. I do yeah. remember pulling the sheets over my head. And same with my dad. He said the same thing. He like pulled the sheets and like cowered under his bed. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
I, I like looking back on it, I kind of, and even my dad said the same thing. Like we both kind of looked at it almost like a warning, you know, like it's funny. Cause like not long after that, like I had mentioned, I kind of straightened out, I kind of straightened out my life. And I, and I, I almost wonder if it was like, you know, like, I don't know, like would, would you know, I, I believe that God could send some sort of a, something to kind of scare you out of, you know, maybe going down the wrong path. And and my dad said the same thing. Like my dad, you know, he wasn't at that point in time, he says that, you know, he wasn't really living what he said he believed either. And then shortly after my parents, you know, ended up splitting up. So, you know, he, he kind of went through, you know, something really tough, like the, the death of one life and a birth into something new. And I kind of did the sure. same thing. So, so I don't know, I've always kind of looked at it like that. And, and I, I've, it, it creeps me out to think about it, but at the same time, like I, it's not like it was ever re- reoccurring. It just happened that one time. I, th- I think you hit upon something there where you're talking about your dad, that there was, he was on the kind of the verge of, of one, an old life and going into something new. And, you know, this is the whole idea of liminal spaces that when our lives are kind of in a, in an upheaval, which, not too long after that, you said your parents got a divorce, then these kind of events, these entities do kind of show up because I don't know what it is about it, why it actually it happens that way. But supernatural uh, occurrences are more likely to happen in times of liminality. Hmm. And that's a uh, uh, credit to Jeff Ritzman, who uh, I still need to get on the show. But he talks about that a lot. And, you know, you, since you mentioned your parents were getting divorced, was there a lot of tension in the household then? Like everybody was kind of feeling on edge? Yeah, yeah. I, I do remember that. Yeah. 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 And, and it was uh, like, it's kind of interesting because like at the same, like my, you know, I had, like I had mentioned, I kind of had like a conversion experience and I, you know, I, I. I'd gone to church since I was a little kid and I never really experienced anything, you know, kind of supernatural. Right. But, but, but it was like, as if in order to really grab me and, and get to me, God had to, God had to intervene in, in almost like a supernatural way and kind of show me, give me some sort of proof that everything I was believing was true. It, you know? It Yeah. It kind of like that was the catalyst to, send you into that direction. Yeah. And I, possibly. yeah, I wonder, I wonder if that's it. So. And, and it could have, it could have actually just been a random thing or something that was in that house or because you guys were in this kind of liminal state in life, it showed yeah. up, but that propelled you forward in, in a sense too. And that's what, that's what these, of these events tend to do as well. Like they tend to propel somebody on to the next stage. I, I've noticed, mm. I've noticed that too. Like these, these, these things can be very profound to people. Mm. I mean, mm. that's genuinely scary. Now, Rob has uh, an experience that I think is just amazing because Rob told me one time, he's like, I never had really weird ex- supernatural experiences except for this one time. And it's like <laughs> the craziest thing. I don't know if you probably <laughs> have heard this, but well, yeah, I was getting ready to go to sleep, and at the time, I shared a bedroom with two brothers. And so I'd gone back there. It was dark. I just crawled into bed and laid down. And I was I was probably laying down for 10 or 15 minutes and decided that um, I wasn't going to be able to sleep. So I, I, I st- uh, started talking to one of my brothers across the room, and we were having just this – I don't remember what we were talking about, but it's just a – Simple conversation. I was like, well, yeah, I, I guess I'm not going to fall asleep. I'm going to go back out and watch TV. And they were like, yeah, okay, man. Good night. And I got up and walked out to the living room. And my whole family, including both my brothers, were already sitting out there watching TV. <laughs> <clears throat> just terrified me. I, I walked in the room and just stopped. And everyone looked at me. And I must have just went white because they were like, are you okay? Do you need to sit down? What's going on? You know, and like, <laughs> I, and part of me wants to chalk it up to like, yeah, I was laying down, but I wasn't tired because I got back up. And went out, you know, to watch TV because I wasn't tired enough to fall asleep. So I don't think it was like a, a half sleep mm. kind of hallucination. I don't know. Wow, that's a that's an awesome story. It's scary. 
Yeah. And it could wow. it could still have been, but not necessarily that that's a way to discount it, but just means that like in that altered state, you were more easily, Rob was more easily reached. Yeah. You mm-hmm. know? Yeah. Yeah. Like I, like going back to kind of like, I remember like when I was a kid, like really like little, I remember like, and again, like, was I same kind of thing? Like, was I half, half in sleep? Was I half not? But I remember like hearing voices in my room yeah. that something would be like, like, Hey, over here, you know? And you I'd like look in the corner, there'd be nothing, you know? Uh, you know, I don't know. It, it, like, I, but again, like, was it just, was it just my overactive imagination being a little afraid of the dark as a kid, you know, like, was I, was I just imagining these things? Like, I don't, I don't know. Um, I find it profound that your dad had the same experience too. Cause it's, mm-hmm. a, it's a lot like mine when I was a kid, you know, my aunt had saw the same thing 30 years earlier that I saw 30 years later, you know? So mm-hmm. it was almost like a validation that something was going on in the house that we both grew up in. I'm mm-hmm. sure you have, you've heard me tell that yeah. story, but yeah. you know, it, it's, it, it, it's also interesting to me too, that people will have this experience and like automatically fall asleep right mm. after it. Yeah. You yeah. know, instead of just being in like in Rob's case, it's a little different because he gets up, he doesn't think anything of it. He walks out into the room, but it's like in so many, in my case, that's how it was. Like when I saw that thing, I fell asleep. And then, mm. you know, Mike Cleland's experience, he talks about seeing those three figures and they he fell asleep. And it's like, there's something, it's almost like something going on with like, I, I think there's an, there is an altered state um, component to this. Yeah. Like uh, that, that part has always kind of freaked me out. The fact that I just fell asleep after seeing it. Cause mm-hmm. you, like in my mind, I always think like, I should be so freaked out at this. You shouldn't be sleeping for days. Like, yeah. Mm-hmm. Like, like I should be like running like, like a little kid, you know, scared half to death into my parents' room saying like, what? like, you know, I'm free. Like, I don't know. But instead I just fell asleep. And I remember, like, I clearly remember falling back asleep, which is weird too. It was like, I remember falling to sleep, which normally I don't, you just kind of like just drift off. Like it was kind of like a switch just went off and boom. I was asleep and I woke up in the morning, you know? Yeah. And there's also the possibility that that could be that these entities are in a, like a kind of a, a symbiosis with us mm. that they kind of feed off our energy. Mm-hmm. And then once they're done feeding, yeah, you fall asleep because you're totally exhausted. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. I always, I always just thought that the, the entity itself just like, flicked a switch and I went to bed. Yeah. Like he was like, experience is over. Boom. I'm leaving. Right. Right. Mm-hmm. That's kind of almost how I felt. I don't know. It might, might've happened. So like something is able to just mess with reality. Yeah. And, 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 and mess with it big time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. There's a lot of things out there that we just don't understand. You no. know, that's, I mean, and that's this stuff and, and this kind of stuff happens to a lot of people. It's not, an unusual thing because I've had people come up to me and say, you know, I don't really believe in this stuff, but this one time I had this really, you know, Mm -hmm. that's usually how those things go. Mm -hmm. You know, did you have any other weird experiences like that? Not, not really. Not, not that I can, not that I can think of. Uh, I do, I do remember. And I don't, again, I don't, this one, I don't know if it was just my imagination, but I remember going to my, uh, to a, a, my, my cousin's place out in Vancouver and them telling me that we think our house is haunted by our grandfather who, who I, I, we knew, uh, we knew, uh, it wouldn't have been my grandfather. It was, the, it was their grandfather. And so I, they said like, sometimes you'll see like weird things will happen in the house and it's un- really unexplainable. And Again, I don't know if it was just because my overactive imagination or whatever, but I'm laying in bed in this house and, and I, I swear I felt the presence of something come into the room, walk in the door and walk around and sit on the bed mm-hmm. at the foot of the bed. Mm. And and it was funny because because they had told me, they said, you if you see if anything like that happens, just say, you know, grandpa, leave me alone. I don't I don't want 
<laughs> I don't want any of this tonight or whatever, something like that. And so I actually vocalized that and I said, you know, grandpa, I don't want any of that tonight, you know, or what I forget <laughs> what I, you know, and, and then I, I kind of felt like it was like calm all of a sudden, you know, but you know, so I, that that was that was the other little like that was kind of a weird thing. And again, they were I don't really I don't really trust it a hundred the experience a hundred percent because they were kind of priming me for it, yeah, you know. Yeah. And so I don't really know like was it just me like half asleep thinking this? Was it just me believe like again and my my imagination? But then you know they 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 would tell me stories like they swore that like th- weird things like hammers would fall off of shelves because the you know the grandfather was a kind of a practical joker he liked a good laugh and, and so they they said they were always like these little things that would happen that kind of freaked him out but they always just kind of laughed it off and that was it you know uh I, I, and I, I, I go on go on i was gonna say i don't i i didn't really i never really heard of any other stories after that i think they kind of moved out of that house and i don't know if I don't know if anything else happened in, in years later, you know, maybe they'll, somebody will listen to the show and then they'll end up telling me something, <laughs> but uh, yeah. I, I think that we can create these things too. You know, we can make these things happen. Uh, we can actually create, make something come out of thin air just for more, I don't know, call it mass hysteria or just, because it's like there's the belief that, hey, something weird is happening in this house. Well, it must be grandpa. Mm-hmm. And then like inadvertently, they created the ghost of grandpa because they're expecting it to happen. Mm-hmm. You know? Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, my, 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 my brother had had a weird experience. And I uh, – when we were little – okay, so we lived we lived in like – we lived on a beach road, you know, along the lake. So there was plenty of houses – you know, it was kind of out in the country, but we had this beach road that ran from the, the main highway down to the beach. And there was lots of houses on this road. So it was kind of and they were all pretty packed tight. So it was almost like a little subdivision or something. And uh, so we weren't out. in the, We were kind of out in the country, but we they were surrounded by all these houses. And there was a bush that was right next to our house. And my brother, when he was little, he, he I don't know if he, he I would guess he would be between seven and ten at this time of this story. You know, he, he was telling me, he's like, you know, I was always really interested in Bigfoot and I had this book on kind of mm-hmm. on Bigfoot and other, other stuff. And he, he says, my brother tells a story that he was playing outside and I don't know if his, he was kicking a ball around or something and it bounced over kind of near the woods. And as he went over near the woods, uh, he says he saw this kind of like way in the woods, he saw this big black hairy shape kind of stand up. Now there's a house, like literally like just on the other side of this bush, this bush is, I don't know, this bush isn't very large. Like you could see the other houses through it. So it's not like it was a super dense bush. It's in, it's in the middle of like a, a populated area. Now he thought that this person or this thing was the next door neighbor kid who was, he was a kid who was a little, uh, he was a little slow. He, he was like, you know, 18 that he had the mind of like a five-year-old kind of thing and he used to play kind of with him so but my brother's like no it wasn't him like i knew what he looked like and he wasn't as tall as this thing was you know and he said that he 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 didn't see a face or anything but he just saw this hairy thing kind of stand up and it freaked him out and he was terrified and he ran inside and was like crying like he just couldn't just didn't know what the heck was going on. He said he took his Bigfoot books and he threw them away. He like, <laughs> he like he didn't want them anymore. And 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 I remember him telling me this story a while ago. And he said because he my brother's really into Bigfoot stuff. Like he loves you know Sasquatch Chronicles and Dogman stories. He listens to a lot of those kind of podcasts and whatnot when he's at work as well. And and he was and and there was sometimes there's those Bigfoot stories where people will see these things come in and out of reality. It's like as yeah. if they're there's some sort of a spiritual entity themselves. And he says it was that kind of a thing. It was like it, it knew – he knew – like it knew that he was interested in that kind of a thing. And all of a sudden this thing appears in a populated – like there's no way a Bigfoot was living you know, in, in that little tiny bush between houses. 
You, know? you think like, someone would notice that? I mean, really? Yeah. You know, like, like a seven or eight foot man beast. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so that that's why it's so ridiculous. But but he he's like, I know what I saw. You know, yeah. what, again, was it was it his imagination playing into that? Like, it could be, but to him, he says it was real. This was this was a real event that happened to him. I think one possibility is you have an entity that sees him and just says, oh, he likes Bigfoot books. So I'll show up as the Bigfoot. That's how I'll manifest. Yeah. Or he somehow created that, you know, um, made something real, like the the, the whole Topa concept. Mm-hmm. You know, we had this lady on the show. You might remember this. Uh, she talked about like all these experiences that she had with 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 Bigfoot unless she lived like somewhere in Oregon or something. And, you know, I, at first I was just so skeptical of her claims, but when I started getting really into the interview, I kind of realized that for her, she's so convinced it's Bigfoot, but it's something manifesting itself as Bigfoot to her. Mm. Yeah. Where if she was someone that was more interested in the ETs or the alien abduction phenomenon, she might be having alien abduction experiences, but for mm-hmm. her, she's interested in Bigfoot. That's her thing. So mm-hmm. I realized that whatever it was showing up was showing up to her as Bigfoot. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. I think I do remember that interview. Yeah. So, I mean, it, the, these, I think these experiences are real and people have them and, but it's just like, the way that you know, the whole co-creation theory that we talked about, with Greg Bishop, I'm sure we, you know you've heard us talk about that. Mm-hmm. You know that I think that that's a definite part of it. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I'd say so. And uh, you know, Rob loves me bringing up the 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 killer clowns, the phantom <laughs> clowns, but I think that's part of the phenomenon. I think that that's. You know, it, it's just this, uh, it works with one or two people in a group and then it can work with the entire consciousness as a whole, which yeah. with the internet, that's. Well, yeah. And we've talked about that. Like exponential. The, the creepy pasta stuff that we know has fictional backgrounds. Yeah. Starting to manifest and people seeing that kind of stuff. And I mean, it could also explain everything from like um, poltergeist activity to even like the, the Marian apparition stuff. and Right. I mean, anything that you deeply uh, either fear or believe in, like, that's just that intense energy and emotion, you know? Yep. And I, and I think that these things, like I said, they can feed off of that. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Yeah. And I think, you know, I was going to say the same thing, like the Slender Man kind of thing. Right. You know, it's just crazy how it's like the power of uh, the power of imagination, the power of of you know, somebody created the story, right? And then all of a sudden, all these people thinking about it kind of made it come come to life in some way. Yeah. But 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 it's funny, like you don't see, you know, being in being in comic books, like you know, you don't see you don't see like people manifesting Superman, you know, like or Batman, like <laughs> those things are those things are in the collective conscience. You know, everybody's into those characters now. But you, you know? do see flying humanoids in Chicago. Yeah, I remember. I, so there's yeah. there could be something to that. Yeah, interesting. Interesting. Yeah. So yeah. I I mean I I don't know. Well, how'd you get you started in comics? That's let's talk about that because this I think is as equally interesting. Like, how'd you get you start like like with with DC with DC, which is pretty like I said before, it's pretty impressive. Yeah. Well, I I had went to. Uh, I had went to college and I was always, I was interested in comic books, you know, from the time I was a teenager and, uh, you know, I had, I had a couple doors closed on some other kind of thing. I want, I wanted to be a filmmaker really in high school. I, I always just wanted to tell story in some way. And, uh, I didn't get into the college I wanted to get into. And one of my teachers said, you should, you should apply to this animation program that was at a local college here in Windsor. And so, I said, you know, I love I love to draw. I'd always liked comic books. Never thought I could be a comic book artist. I always thought there's no way I'll ever be good enough, 
you know, to draw at that, at that high quality to actually get a job in comics. So maybe I'll take this animation program. Maybe it'll open up a bunch of different doors. I could get into, you know, maybe I could work for Disney or Pixar or something like that. And so I, I went through this animation college and I, I really enjoyed it, but I, my, my love was always, was still illustrating, was still, you know, uh, you know, drawing, I didn't, I didn't really like the animation process because you had to draw very simple things and, and make them move. Whereas I just wanted to draw really sweet, detailed pictures, you know? And, uh, so I, I got out of that, 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 uh, I got out of school and, um, that was around the time that, like I had mentioned, I kind of, my life kind of straightened out and I, I really became serious about my faith and, uh, and serious about kind of trying to find where God wanted me to be instead of where I really wanted to be. And, you know, God, God, I felt like God was telling me to give up on my art and go to Bible college. So I kind of reluctant, I reluctantly, I kind of did. I said, well, okay, you know, I'll, 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 I'll trust that, you know, you got a plan for what you have, you know, for my life. So I went to this Bible college and while I was there, you know, I, I, um, I gained a really good, strong foundation to kind of, to build my life on. And I, it kind of humbled me in a lot of ways. And I kind of realized that a lot of the goals I had set for myself were just like kind of selfish goals. Like I just wanted money, you know, girls and, and fame, you know, <laughs> and, and it's, and instead when I was there, I kind of realized, no, you know what? Like I, I have a, I have a unique talent. I can draw, I can tell story, you know, you know, maybe, maybe I, I can use that in some way you know, for, for good, or I can use that in a way to inspire and, 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 uh, you know, just really find a job that I enjoy to do and not worry about all those other things. And, uh, you know, while I was there, I, I ended up meeting my wife there and, uh, you know, I had a really good, good year at this Bible college, but then I felt that that's really where I kind of got the, the go again from, from God to, to kind of chase after the, the comic book thing again. And it was almost like all of a sudden I was just like super inspired. And it was like all of these things that I kind of learned from, from high school and studying comic books and, and college art and all these kind of things all of a sudden just clicked. And I could, I could just like, I was able to like draw a lot better. I was focused. I had kind of a, a, a goal again. And so I started kind of working on a portfolio and there was a guy, there's a, there's a guy from my local area here in Windsor, Ontario. His name is David Finch. And uh, David's one of the biggest comic book artists in the world. At that time, I think he was the biggest comic book artist in the world. He was at Marvel and he was working on Avengers and Wolverine and X-Men and all this stuff. And he was just, he was like the biggest name. And I, I knew that he kind of lived in my area. And so I, a friend of mine knew him or had a contact for him. And so I just, I ended up emailing him and sent him my portfolio and said, is there any chance that you could just critique my work? Just give me a little critique. And he ended up inviting me over to his house. So I, I drove over to his house and uh, he, he tore my work to shreds. But he said, huh. I, think you, I think you have some talent. Let's see what we can do here. And so he started giving me these little drawing assignments. And uh, he would send me away and be like, okay, I want you to fill up this page full of heads or arms or legs. And he would kind of show me how to draw the human head the way that he would he would do it. And here's some little shortcuts. And you know, here's how you draw the nose correctly from this angle or whatever. And then he would send me home and he would say, okay, fill up a page of heads and come back in two days and show me. And I'll critique him and – you know, we'll see if, you know, go from there. Well, I would go home and I would fill up like three pages of whatever he had me draw. And I would come back and he would go like, whoa, you know, he had a lot more to critique. And, and so he would critique and, and we did this for like six months. I would, I would go every couple of days and, and then he would give me a little assignment. You know, it started off with human bodies and stuff. Then it was like buildings and cars and, you know, alien kind of sci-fi tech and, uh, you know, trees and, you know, superhero bodies and capes and fabric and all kinds of stuff. And it was like a little mini comic book boot camp. And so at the end of that six months, he kind of, he did a switch. He went from DC and he went over to Marvel and uh, he said, you know, I think you have, I think you have a good enough portfolio. Why don't we send it in and see if we can get you a job? And so we, he wrote this little like six page story. It was like a little Batman story and I drew it 
and I sent it, we sent it over to DC and one of the editors at DC saw it and seemed, you know, he liked it. And there was a, a couple jobs they had where they needed uh, it's called a fill in artist. So if an art, if the regular artist on a series can't keep up the deadline, uh, they'll bring in a fill in artist to kind of finish off the remaining pages of that book or to finish off the next, the next issue so that he can get a jump on the issue after that kind of thing. And so, uh, they get, I got a job and I did, uh, in my opinion, I didn't do very well at it. I was like being thrown like, you know, to go from just kind of drawing at your own pace to all of a sudden having to draw to a deadline and pump out a page a day. I mean, I was working like I, at that point in time, I was working like, you know, 16 hours, 17 hours a day, just try to get, just to get these pages done. But uh, I must have impressed somebody because they kept giving me work. And, uh, you know, I, I, I started off my first ever work I did was on uh, issue of issue 70 of uh, Superman, Batman. Uh, this was around 2010. And uh, then I went and I did some uh, Batman stuff. And then I I was uh, hired as a – I got an exclusive contract with DC, uh, which means that you, you sign this contract and essentially you just work for DC Comics. But it's, it makes it – it just makes life a lot easier because now you know how much work you're going to get in that year and you're going to know how much yeah. money you can make. It's kind of more – you know, uh, it's a lot more solid than just kind of being a freelancer. And so, uh, I, I, I signed that. I ended up, they ended up giving me a chance to draw the main, um, uh, to draw the detective comics, which was also an, a Batman title. So I did that for like a year and, uh, you know, and then, and then I got to work on justice league with Jeff Johns. This was about two years ago. I did that. And, uh, Jeff Johns is one of the biggest names in all of comics, I mean, I've, I've been reading his stuff for years and just loved it. And, uh, you know, to, to have an opportunity to finally work with a writer who is, in my opinion, the, the biggest comic book writer in the world at, at this time was, uh, was really awesome. And I learned a lot from him and, and it's just kind of progressed from there. And I've, I've been able to do some really cool projects, a, a lot of Batman stuff, except for what I'm, uh, working on right now, which is Swamp Thing. And, uh, yeah. Yeah, and it's kind of, it's funny. I, I joke. I said, you know, my my dream character to draw was Batman, and uh, this Swamp Thing book will be the first book in seven years that I haven't that doesn't have Batman in it. I had a streak going where every single thing I've drawn for the past seven years has had Batman in it as a lead character, yeah. and and so it's like. You know this this swamp thing, but kind of breaks that uh, <laughs> breaks that record for me. But but uh, swamp thing is is my I say my favorite three DC characters would probably be Batman, then Superman, and then Swamp Thing. And so I couldn't pass up this opportunity to work on this character. Right on, yeah. What's the uh, so what is the Swamp Thing comic that you're that you're working on? So what we're doing is it's called the uh, Swamp Thing Winter Special. It comes out uh, in January. Um, what it what it really is is it's a tribute to the two creators of Swamp Thing, uh, Len Len Wein and Bernie Wrightson, who both passed away, I believe, in 2017. Yeah. Um, and so this is kind of like a tribute issue in a way to them. Um, I'm doing a story with a writer by the name of Tom King, who's uh, one of the biggest talents in comics right now he's 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 won so many awards for his work and when i i kind of pitched i kind of pitched dc uh what i wanted to do a swamp thing and i specifically wanted to work with him because i really felt he has that alan moore-esque style of writing and the way that he he plots his comics has that feeling and i really felt like he would deliver a really good and unique Swamp Thing experience that kind of felt classic, but at the same time was modern. And so I had pitched that to them and, and DC was kind of like, well, you know, we don't really have Swamp Thing slated anytime soon. You know, we, we you know, we were going to do a new series at some point, but it just, I don't know if it's in the, it's in the cards right now. I don't know if it's going to happen. Haven't and then, they done like two new series or something since the, well, there was the, the the series that lasts like a hundred and fifty something. That's the that's the big one. 
Mm -hmm. Has there been like two more since then or something? Yeah. Around, I think around 2010 when they did the new 52 DC, the new 52, they kind of rebooted everything. They had yeah. they had a really good Swamp Thing series written by Scott Snyder, and uh, he did that book for quite a, a, a while. And uh, uh, but but the thing like Swamp Thing, let's just be honest here, it's not a big selling title. You know, yeah. your your your, mo your money makers at DC are Batman and Justice League and Wonder Woman you know superman and so those are the books that that they want their top talent on and i i, I don't want to sound prideful or arrogant or whatever you know but but they they want they want artists like me on their top tier books because it helps sell more books um so when you're coming to them and you're saying i want to do a swamp thing story they're kind of looking at you like, well, you know, is it, would the book even make enough money <laughs> to essentially <laughs> recoup the costs of paying all of the talent that especially they wanted to have on the book? There's, you know, there's all kinds of stuff like that that kind of goes on but that I didn't really ever think about, but I kind of learned while doing this book. And, and, uh, but I really felt like, I really felt inspired. I really just wanted to draw the character. I've, I've loved Swamp Thing ever since I was a little kid. Uh, I, I didn't, I never, I didn't read the comics when I was a kid. I was introduced to the character through a cartoon show that used to be on TV. Oh, and there was, yeah, I remember that. There was a Swamp Thing cartoon, uh -huh. and they made these really, really cool toys as well. And I had all the action figures. I still have them. <laughs> and uh, that I always just, being a visual person, the, the character of Swamp Thing is always just, you know, I've really loved it. And I, I remember even drawing the character when I was a little kid. And I fell in love with the comics later on and, and down the line, but I really, it was kind of like, you know, my, my bucket list of DC characters I want to draw. I've drawn pretty much all the characters. I've drawn the Flash and Wonder Woman and Green Lantern and Batman and uh, Joker and all the big bad guys. I wanted to draw Swamp Thing. He was the one character I hadn't been able to tackle yet in my career. What about Aquaman? I've drawn Aquaman. I've okay. drawn Aquaman. He he's actually he's actually really hard to draw with that stupid chain mail shirt that he wears. <laughs> you, got, you have to draw these like fish scale things all over the place. And, but it looks really cool when you draw it, you know. Um, but actually Swamp Thing's harder because he's just this big organic mass of Yeah, he's a plant. You know, <laughs> plant and vine you can't really draw them like you would draw superman or batman you have to like think differently about how you draw them um but the but the way that the, the story kind of moved forward was that uh, you know they len ween the creator of swamp thing had written one last swamp thing story he was he was writing at i think near the time he passed away and they were they, i think they were planning on doing a Swamp Thing miniseries with him writing kind of like his, wow. his final, final hurrah. Yeah. And because he knew that he was, he didn't have much more time. And so he had passed away and I, and then they said, well, I think we're going to do this as kind of like a tribute issue. And we're going to actually have an artist, uh, Kelly Jones. He's coming in. Uh, he's been a longtime collaborator with uh, Len Wein and um, he's coming in to draw that final Swamp Thing story. And so you're going to have, uh, kind of an issue you're gonna have the story that we worked on which is about 40 pages so it's a it's a nice thick dense story uh but it's a short story it's a self-contained thing and then you're gonna have the the final um len ween swamp thing story and so i think it's gonna really make for a nice tribute um you know to to the creators and uh my, myself like i'm a huge bernie wrightson fan being an artist i i've uh, i've studied his art the way that he drew monsters and and Swamp Thing and zombies. And he's got a beautiful Frankenstein book that he was working on uh, that he never finished either because he passed away. And so uh, to me, this book is kind of like, it's a fitting tribute to, to creators, comic book creators that really left their mark on pop culture. Um, you know, Len, Len Wein not only created Swamp Thing, but he created Wolverine. Um, oh, did he really? Yeah, so oh, wow. I mean, he, you know, and he's created a lot of other characters uh, as well, and so you know, these guys had had significant have have created pop culture characters that are, will live on far beyond uh, you know their lives, and uh, inspired inspired me as a young kid, and so you know, this book's kind of uh, kind of like a love letter, you know, to the character and to to the creators as well. How does it work when you? Uh 
write a comic, but do, do, do they give you the, does the, the author give you a script and then you just make the panels from the script? Yeah, that's pretty much how it works. He, different writers will write different ways. So, you know, some script writers are just very, very simple. They'll just tell you like, you know, uh, panel one, I don't know, city at night, moon rising above city, panel two, you know, feet running across a, a building top, you know, panel th- three, um, shadow jumps off of building down into alleyway and then turn the page and then big full page of Batman, you know, making his appearance. And it'll be as like simple as that. And then it's up to you to kind of create the camera angles and to, and to create, you know, what's really kind of going on. They kind of just give you, you know, they give you the dialogue so you know what the characters are maybe saying, but, but they kind of let you, certain writers will just let you go, go wild. And then there's other writers who will really lay it out. Like I know Grant Morrison, his scripts are very, I've never worked with Grant Morrison, but I know people have worked with him. Mm -hmm. His scripts are very like highly detailed to the point where he's listing every little thing that should be in that panel. And I know, I know some, I've never worked with Grant Morrison, so I can't say if I really would like that, but I kind of like just having the freedom to, to be a storyteller myself, you know, give me what kind of you want, what things you think are important, but, you know, let me, let me create the visual, you know? And so, uh, a lot of the writers I've worked with have been very good with that. And just kind of like, I know with the Swamp Thing story, there was a lot of different things that I, I read the script and said, well, I think uh, let's add something in here. Let's change this page or let's do this. And, and he was like, yep, this is your story. Go nuts. You know, I'll, I'll, we'll, we'll change any dialogue we need to go. If you just feel, if you feel something like this should be changed, let's do it. And so, you know, those kinds of collaborations are a lot of fun and uh, just kind of allow you as a visual storyteller. I, I trust, I trust the writer to craft a great story and to have, the story beats that you need and, and strong dialogue. And, and a lot of these, a lot of the writers, they do understand visually how to tell a story. They know when to have a close up. They know when to have a medium shot or a long shot or a really extreme pulled back shot showing a whole bunch of stuff. They, they know how to craft it and they know how to craft pages so that it has a certain amount of panels so that, you know, if, if you have lots of panels, that means you have to kind of slow down and, and it builds, it, everything's building up and up and up and up. And they know when to have, you know, very little panels and just let the art kind of speak for itself. And, uh, you know, so you trust them, but at the same time, it's like, I want them to trust me that I know what I'm doing and I can deliver. I'm going to be able to deliver this, a, a visual story that is going to really captivate people. Um, so that's yeah, that's kind of how it works. Every every team's got different different ways of working. Um, you know, that's I've kind of found a way I like to work, and you know, just go with it. Yeah, I've all, I've often wondered about that, like mm-hmm. how that how that that process actually works. Mm-hmm. Is there ever going to be a Swamp Thing movie? I hope. make a new movie. Me too. I hope. I think you'll see the character. There's been there's been rumors for a while that they're going to make a. Uh, a it's based off of a comic book from a number of years ago called uh, Justice League Dark. And it was kind of like, you know, John Constantine and Swamp Thing and I don't know, a whole bunch of kind of like more of the spiritualist slash occultist kind of characters that DC has. Yeah. Kind of forming a team to fight against other supernatural entities. And so there was – that movie was in development at one point, uh, but I think it was shelved or put on the – back burner i don't i don't know if they would necessarily take the chance on swamp thing as a a movie just yet i think they would want to introduce him in some other fashion first but i really hope they do it because uh, swamp thing is you know he's just like this tragic you know this tragic figure who you know was once a man gets turned into a monster he's kind of like a frankenstein you know sort of thing you know and uh you know, he's always had great bad guys and, and a very interesting kind of story. And uh, he, the characters changed over the years into different iterations and whatnot. But I think the, you know, the uh, the core of the character has always been there. Yeah, yeah. I always loved the the main villain that he fought, Arcane. Oh, it's mm-hmm. like they did, uh, Alan Moore did a lot of cool things with him. 
Yeah. You know, that they, they would always periodically bring him back. Like he, the first, when you first see him, he's like this old man that's mm-hmm. like messing around with like, uh, like re-energizing <laughs> bodies, like these mutants. And then yeah. at one point he's like this insect like creature. And then like, he comes back from the dead in the Alan Moore series. And, you know, they just kept bringing him back and back. And yeah, I thought, um, but yeah, they needed to make a movie. Cause like the West Craven movie is okay. Mm-hmm. You know, the one from the early eighties, but then like the return of the swamp thing, it's terrible. It's just, yeah. it's just awful. <laughs> and I, I, I I grew up watching those movies too because they would be on TV, and so you would tape them off of TV and you'd watch uh-huh. them. And when you're a little kid, you think they're captivating. Like I, I would watch them over and over and over again. But while I was working on the Swamp Thing book, I rewatched those movies, and I was like, "Yeah, these are awful. Like, these, movies <laughs> suck. these movies really suck." Especially Return of the Swamp Thing, which I liked as a kid. I think uh-huh. I liked that movie better, but rewatching i was like man that was a really yeah that's the one with heather locklear in it yeah it's like a <laughs> it's a total c-list movie kind of thing you know uh, yeah well they tried to make it to do a comedy like yeah, i said like the west craven one is okay i mean you know it, it's it's very 80s yeah but you know it's it's okay well i think at that point the return of swamp thing movie they made it more they wanted to make it more kid friendly or more comedy because at the time like I mentioned, there was like a Swamp Thing cartoon and there was toys and, yeah. you know, like my friends at school had like the action figures and stuff. So it was like it was within like in, in our pop culture, within our my grade, like two class or whatever, the, whatever grade I was in at the time. Like we knew who Swamp Thing was because we all watched the cartoon show and we had the action figures. So it was kind of like at that point in time, he was kind of like he was like a popular kind of character in some way. And I think that was because of the Alan Moore comics becoming – they were just yeah. winning awards and, and they were raved about. And uh, and they are great, great comic books. That's really uh, got yeah. what he got him noticed in the U.S. was the Swamp Thing. Mm-hmm. Like he completely yeah. changed that character. Like he turned it into something completely different. Yeah. You know, between that and Watchmen, you know, mm-hmm. he, he – you know, that those are the two DC – big DC care uh, books that he kind of – you know, spearheaded and, uh, you know, he, he did leave his mark. And I think, you know, ever since I think Swamp Thing has been more of the Alan Moore version of Swamp Thing rather than the original version. Um, but, uh, yeah, you know, it's, I've always loved the character and I really think that this book like this, the, the story that we have in this, this issue is, is pretty heavy, uh, you know, without, without spoiling it or giving it all away, uh, I'll just kind of set it up that, that the story is about Swamp Things and, and this little boy that he finds surviving in a uh, a massive snowstorm that has kind of engulfed the, the world. And it's kind of it's like a survivalist tale of uh, Swamp Thing trying to protect this little boy against the elements and mm. against uh, and against the snow monster, which the boy um is, is terrified of and, and they're on the run from. So they're, they're trying to survive the elements and swamp thing because he's a plant, you yeah. know, plants don't do well when it's snowing and freezing out and the sun is being, you know, is blocked out because of all the snow and everything like that. So he's slowly, he's slowly getting weaker and weaker and they're being chased and hunted by, by the snow monster. And uh, it's really a story it's really a touching story. It's, it's an emotional story. It deals with anxiety. It deals with, uh, hopelessness. Um, it's, it's a, it's a very different story than anything I've really drawn. I've all the books I've drawn have been big, big, bold superhero stories, good versus evil, you know, people in spandex fighting monsters from outer space. <laughs> kind of thing. And then this is the op, this is a very touching personal story which is something that i i like to draw i love drawing those quiet quiet scenes and and me having you know my my son he's two years old and the little boy in this comic he's about five years old but i really tried to approach it from that angle of like you know i i now know what it what it feels like to love to love a child to love my son and i tried to approach this book from that perspective like how Mm. how would swamp thing act to this little boy at first and then how would he act as as he gets to know him and protect him and 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 learns to love this little boy 
And, uh, and the little boy, the same thing is scared of swamp thing at first, but then he sees him as almost like a father or a protector. And so, you know, I was able to kind of draw on some of my own experiences with, you know, experiences, me and my son and, and, uh, kind of knowing how, kind of how a little kid acts and how he, you know, how, how he deals with things. And, and, uh, it was, a, it's a different kind of book, but sometimes you, I, I was just, I was really just yearning for something like that. You know, you, you want to, I, I know where, I know, you know, my skill and, and the, where the places that DC wants me to be is on books that are those big, bold superhero stories. This, but every, but you, you sometimes you just want to do the total opposite, <laughs> you know. Sometimes you just want to go and do something that is different, and you need to do it to kind of cleanse your palate, to kind of get something, uh, you know, off your chest in in a sort of way, like uh, onto the page, get it out of your mind, on the page, do it, and explore something different. And I really feel like this book could be one of those books that will, you know, go down as you know one of the better better stories I ever draw. Uh, and, uh, and I'm really excited for people to read this. I, I, um, I'm interested to see, you know, how, how they, how they enjoy the story. Very cool. Very cool. Jason. I'm glad you're doing it. I can't wait to, to, when it comes out, I'm going to get it for sure. Awesome. Awesome. Well, uh, tell people where they can find your work. I mean, obviously DC comics, but you know, um, anything else that you have, like, uh, do you have a website out there that you'd like to give out or. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, you can follow me on Twitter, um, at Jason Fabok, uh, J S O N F A B O K. Um, I'm on, I'm on Twitter. I have an Instagram account where I like to post a lot of my art. Uh, I do have, uh, I do have a blog. Uh, it's uh, jasonfabok.blogspot.com, though I haven't updated that thing in a while. Um, usually what I do is I like to post, you know, after a comic book has come out, come out I like to kind of post, you know, the, the artwork from my perspective, just the, the plain, the black and the white, you know, inked pages, you know, before they get sent to the colorist and uh, kind of show off, you know, kind of a little behind the scenes look at, at com uh, at the books that I work on. So um, I should get back into that and do that. Um, but uh, if you follow me on Instagram or on Twitter, or even on, uh, I have a little Facebook uh, artist page. Um, you can kind of see a lot of that stuff. I like to, to post on those things. And, and um, yeah, uh, you know, I, if you, if you're looking for some of my work, there's a lot of the collected editions are out now in bookstores and comic book stores. And like I mentioned, I worked on detective comics for a while and I worked on a, a series called Batman eternal. And, uh, I worked on, uh, justice league, uh, the dark side war. Uh, that's what our series was called. Uh, it was like a big world ending event kind of thing that was happening. And I recently actually did a speaking of Alan Moore. I recently did, uh, a little lead up to what DC's doing now. Uh, DC's doing this this event now called Doomsday Clock, which is kind of like a uh, a sequel in in some way to Watchmen, mm. but it but it mixes kind of like the the DC heroes and the Watchmen characters kind of collide and uh, mm. meet. And uh, it's actually it's being written by Jeff Johns, who wrote the uh, Justice League. Um, books that I was working on. And he's, he's really like the first, I read the first issues out and I got a sneak peek to, to read the second issue. And he's, it's really reads and feels like the original Watchmen. Uh, it's, it's really incredible. And the story is going to be really cool. And I got to work on kind of the prequel to that, the lead up to that, which was called simply the button. And it was Batman finds the, the comedian, the, the smiley face button. And we kind of had this whole storyline that that went on with that, and so uh, that that graphic novel is now in stores. It's called I think it's just called Batman: The Flash, uh, The Button, and so you can check that out as well. Um, yeah, and there, you know, reach out to anybody out there. Re reach out to me. I like to to uh, I'm always cool with responding to to different people and questions and you know and whatnot. So uh, yeah. Well, very cool. Thank you so much, Jason. And, uh, guys, we will be back, uh, like I said, double guest episode. Uh, we'll be back with, uh, Brian Godawa on Conspirator Normal. <laughs>
guys, welcome to the second part of the two guest show. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Jason Fabach for coming on. That was really cool talking to him. And now we have a writer on the show, Mr. Brian Godawa, for the fourth time. I think this is the fourth time on Conspiracy Normal. <laughs> <laughs> That's a crowd. <laughs> So welcome back to the show. <laughs> always, always me, great to have you. Uh, I was telling you our little chit chat banter before that uh, I've enjoyed reading uh, both Tyrant and the Rim. That I really like your writing style because it just it you have the kind of style that really makes you visualize what's going on, and, and it's it's just like kind of seeing a movie in your head. Cool. You know, so I, I can goal. tell that That's this is goal. like a, it, your, your script writer uh, <laughs> training yeah. comes out in, in, in the way that you write. But I think it's really I think it's really awesome. This uh, this book, of course, we're kind of dealing with uh, the whole preterist argument for um, of end time prophecy. But before we get started on that. I wanted to talk to you a little bit about, you know, what's going on in Hollywood, you know, because with the Harvey Weinstein thing, because, you know, in the first uh, on the previous episode, we talked about Harvey Weinstein, Kevin Spacey and, you know, Corey Feldman coming out with his allegations and all this. And, you know, you you live out there in Hollywood. You're a screenwriter, as I mentioned before. So you have some exposure to this world. So I kind of wanted to get your perspective on everything that's going on. Yeah, you know, I do, but not to uh, paint a picture um, of, you know, heavy involvement. Um, I'm, I'm really more of a independent filmmaker in Hollywood, you know, because I, I'm, of course, and I'm a um, nonconformist and a iconoclast and I don't tend to uh, fit into the Hollywood rape culture. Um, <laughs> so, but, you know, but I mean, it goes deeper than that. Uh, I think that, you know, it, it, it all gets back to uh, an entire worldview of, of, you know, rejecting of God, rejection of moral absolutes and the celebration of, um, you know, immorality on, on every level. Is there any surprise that, you know, they're behaving mm -hmm. this way? Of course there isn't. Um, but, you know, and the kind of stories I tell, they don't, they don't necessarily fit in well with the, uh, the narrative and the, the culture, uh, you know, in Hollywood and, and in Hollywood, people like to work with people that they get along with and that they agree with and all that. So when they find out your viewpoints, uh, like mine, you know, I, I'm pretty much the, probably one of the more, monstrous pariahs uh, in, in Hollywood in terms of I'm everything they hate. I'm a white, male, heterosexual, Christian, conservative. Those are all the five most uh, monstrous evils to them. And so I don't fit in. And so consequently, you know, a lot of my stuff I've made outside of the studio system. I'm not on, in the studio system and I'm an independent filmmaker. But, you know, I mean, of course, I'm, you know, I interact with people who are and such um, a little bit. And, um, you know, all I can say is that even from, from my perspective, from what little I've seen and known, uh, it's, you know, it's, there is a reckoning that's going on here. Um, and, yeah, no doubt. and, and they're pretty much all, they, they really are pretty much all dirty be, because not that they're all doing it, but that, you know, and the most obvious thing that's coming out is, is that they've all helped hide it and protect it. And women as well, you know. Um, and yeah, of course, there's some victimization that's clearly there because women can lose their career. So if they're the ones who are a true victim in, in, in these cases, they can't – they really – I can understand and I, I can totally sympathize and empathize with them why they, they're afraid to to talk about this, at least in the past, right? Um, and But the problem is – Okay, so so it's a in a way it's a good thing because the truth is coming out and they're they're free to do so, but the, there's a really dark downside to this because the you know the where that's coming from is itself the same cesspool of evil that created the monster to begin with. So I don't think it's 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 going to end well or just. I don't think it's ending with justice because what's what we're now sliding into this once women who are fueled by this hatred and this, you know, feminist uh, hatred for the patriarchy, this illusionary world that they've created in their mindset and it's really affected a lot of women in Hollywood and once they realize that this is our chance to get back 
at the patriarchy and at men, you know, they, they, they're motivated to basically lie and they're motivated to, to exaggerate and, and stress the truth because in the name of the good cause, because, you know, Hollywood is like that. Hollywood is basically the religion of Hollywood is leftism. And they believe that the cause, their causes, whether it's global warming or, you know, um, what have you, uh, their causes are more important than people and more important than the truth. So that's why they're willing to lie and, and tell narratives because they believe that ultimately the narrative is what's important. And so, you know, this is why uh, a lot of them have held back, you know, because, you know, even with going into the political realm, right? So anyway, so what I see is the danger is that now we're creating a culture of, uh, of um, that is anti-due process. Meaning, you know, people uh, are now um, accusations. All, all that's needed is an accusation without proof. And so to make someone guilty. And that is not only immoral, but it's destructive of society. Because once you have a society and a culture that jettisons the notion of due process, that jettisons the notion of, of um, you know, uh, innocent until proven guilty – then that eventually leaks into the court of law where it will, you'll lose it in the court of law as well. And yeah. this is why, you know, you hear these, you know, various women saying, I don't care if, if it's not true, it's good to see men lose their jobs and all this kind of stuff. And so there's this real venomous hatred that I think is going to uh, create a lot of false narratives that we cannot trust. And so I don't doubt the, you know, probably the integrity and honesty of most of the original cases where women are finally free and they open up and, and, uh, it's nice to see these, uh, men who have been normally untouchable because of their power. Uh, it's, it's, it's good in one level to see them get their comeuppance, but in another level, it, it, the monster you're creating to fight the, the previous monster when the, the monster creating could actually be worse. <laughs> so it, it always, I'm, I'm actually concerned. <clears throat> well, it always seems like, you know, the, the old phrase, the path to hell, is paved with good intentions. I mean, it seems like that's mm -hmm. kind of what's going on because, yeah, it is good in a way that, yeah, these guys like Weinstein, you know, they're getting exposed for what they are. But at the same yeah. time, that's like once a snowball gets rolling, it becomes an, an avalanche and how many innocent people kind of get caught up in it. It seemed like for a while and, there, you know, I mean, it was getting really ridiculous. Yeah. And, 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 you know, like I said, this is the thing that this, th I'm not kidding. Hollywood is a rape culture. And, um, and that's why on one level, you know, and this is the stuff that I have, look, I wasn't even in the, in, in the, the Hollywood world, but 15 years ago when I was trying to break in, I even knew about the stories about Harvey Weinstein and sure. I was questioning, I was sending, uh, scripts to their dimension pictures for horror movies because they were doing really well. And I was kind of afraid. I'm going, maybe should, should I do this? Cause I hear he's just a monster with people, you know, not necessarily the sexual side, but I think that was part of it, you know, but so the, the, the problem is, is that they're all, they're all guilty be, you know, so, so, so you can't trust any of them, you know, because the people who are now standing up and, and, you know, uh, supposedly uncovering all this stuff, well, they were the ones that helped hide it. So, so how yeah. can we trust them too? You know? So that's the, the problem that, uh, uh, that, that, but I, you know, like I say, there's another side that, you know, there's, there's always two sides to this. And, and, um, I think that, um, it, you know, uh, we are entering in, into a new era where these men cannot get away with this. Oh, and by the way, it, it goes far, far deeper than that because there's a deeper ring of pedophilia um, that has been going around. And, and because homosexuals are the high, one of the highest victim classes, they're the most protected, uh, that those are the ones that are not going to come out as well because they're, they've got a culture uh, that's even worse. And um, that's what Corey Feldman was was talking about. And um, there's a great documentary I saw called Open Secret. You got to watch yeah, it uh, I've, or Open I've Secrets. Seen it. Or, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, it's really good. It's on Amazon, so I, I recommend everyone watch it because because there it goes much darker than anyone is realizing here. And uh, that stuff needs to get exposed and and brought to the light as well. So let's hope that uh, there will be justice. Will will challenge this. Oh, so what I'm saying is, you know. Uh, I, I'm sitting here going, well, no, wait a minute, wait a minute. You have created this antichrist culture of 
hatred of Christians and mor- Christian morality and the celebration of promiscuity, right? And, you know, most movies are about, you know, so many movies are about simply, you know, uh, 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 mocking and and deconstructing the Christian worldview and so- showing how we need to be free from the shackles of these, these you know, uh, sociological norms that are oppressing us, the patriarchy and of Christianity and blah, blah, blah. Well, when you do that, the, you get the monsters that they have, right? And and it's and they so really they created the very culture that they're now complaining about, you know. And it wouldn't surprise me that they would also blame this monster they created on Christianity as well. And uh, you know, I wouldn't it wouldn't be surprised. But you know, I also think that it's smart then for those who are innocent to start fighting back, you know, and I think a, one example is the Jeremy Piven, you know, I'm not saying I don't, I don't know if he's innocent or not, but he's so, you know, he's so, um, uh, determined about that, that he took a lie detector test and he passed it. And he's challenging oh. these women to take lie detector tests. So that's where I'm saying maybe this, this might be one of the examples of how this bleeding and leaking into lies are it, when women are seeing how they can give back at the men they hate. And a lot of these a lo- pretty much whenever you get power, you know, a lot of these men become jerks in general. Right. And so this right. is this way to get back at these men. So, uh, and now they see, now you can actually think about it. you look and even I can see, wow, if you make an accusation, everyone's pushing to automatically believe you no matter what, even so much so that when some like Lena Dunham and, and some other famous actresses who kind of tried to step out and say, well, it's not always true. And sometimes, you know, women have to, they were stomped on and they go back and they backpedal and apologize. So you can't challenge women. So women now know I won't be challenged and I won't have to prove it. It's just, you know, so right there, that in itself shows you, there's a movie, you know, it shows you that you've, you've set up the ability where women know that they can, they don't have to be accountable for what they say. Well, what are, what do you think they're going to do? Of course, they're going to, of course, they're going to use it to their advantage to destroy their enemies, right? Yeah, it's like we're setting up something. You're just setting up the opposite almost. And you yeah. know, that's that's the part that concerns me. I mean, you know, and what also concerns me too. You know, the pedophilia stuff as well. I I, I think that's more. There's what a, there's I've, a ring. It's yeah. it's absolutely and and it is conspiratorial. Like the you know the heterosexual side is is um you know it's generic right. Men, a lot of men most men are pigs and well guess what homosexual men are pigs just like heterosexual men. They just have a different sexual orientation right. But right. as a matter of fact, there's a higher percentage of the pedophilia. I know it's politically incorrect to say that, but that's the truth. And there there's a deeper ring in Hollywood of these men who have have built this system. So they're, they've been more deliberate about it. Whereas, you know, the heterosexual men, they're, they're, they're the availability of victims to them is far more, is far broader, right? Yeah. Um, far broader opportunities. So they can, they can just throw their seeds, so to speak out to, to see who they can catch in the net. And, um, but, uh, yeah, so it's, it's a deeper, darker world when you get into the, the, uh, homosexual side of things there. What's you know? your thoughts on Corey Feldman? Because I mean, this seems controversial in and of itself. The fact that he's asking for, Ten million dollars on this Kickstarter or GoFundMe, whatever it is that he's doing, and he's yeah. People have been really criti- critical of him because, like, why don't you just come out and say it? But you know, we played a clip on this show where he was saying, like, well, I, I, basically, it was almost like what he needed was protection to even get this thing out because yes. this stuff goes so that, deep in that in that community. That's absolutely true, and it's criminal. Think about it too. This is underage. Children. So this is not just sexual predation. This is, you know, this is rising to such cri- a, a much deeper criminality involved. Right. And, th- you know, uh, so his life would actually be in jeopardy. But the truth is, is he's right. If he were to name names, I think he has actually named a couple after that, you know, but if he named the big names like Brian Singer, that has been, ele- Brian Singer has been alleged to be in that, in that yep. circle. These guys are so powerful. Uh, he would be immediately sued and he would be destroyed uh, completely, uh, for that. So, um, uh, and especially since, you know, it's, it's been so long ago, right? So, uh, he's in a much more difficult situation. And, and here's the thing though, he was trying to speak out though, for many years when it was not acceptable and it, it, it ruined his career. So the guy has shown the integrity to try to speak out. 
So he's already established that. Now the fact is, now the fact that he sees, well, now the the wave is now going on his side, and I don't, I understand. I'm, I, I don't think it was a wise thing to do, to set up the Kickstarter thing and and make make some money, but. You know, can you blame him? And after all, that's Hollywood is entertainment, and it's about public public relations. And you always try to milk everything to get attention and to make money because that's how you survive. And again, I, I don't I don't necessarily condone that, but I also don't condemn it because I understand. You know, he's been abused and lost his career and lost lost it all for years. Now his is his chance to sort of get a little bit back and survive from it. So you know, I don't uh, condemn the guy for it. I I don't think it was wise because it does make him look less trustworthy but look he's a bro- this is the thing about him he's he's a broken man yeah. and he that's part of the whole point is it it destroyed him and he's he's got the honesty to expose all that he is with his faults included that doesn't mean that that he's lying you know um so that's that's the big problem is is that uh, and i think that's the the number one means of destruction when people speak out with the truth the both the media and uh, legally uh, the victimizers will always immediately uncover any dirt or anything to make the victim look unreliable. And the problem is that it doesn't matter. Someone can be a jerk and, and, and can even be a drug addict or whatever, but if you rape them, it's, you raped them, right? Uh, but that's the that's the mode of how the media um, and the PR machine uh, destroys the the witnesses and the victims is by by uncovering their flaws, right? So if we can just see past a, past some of that to some degree, or you know, shall we say, uh, you need to read between the lines and balance the truth. Truth is always a balance of those two things, and and uh, yeah, it's a. It's a really interesting time. I've never seen anything happen so quickly. Um, but in a way, it 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 were it it makes sense because Harvey Weinstein really was the the king. Of, he was like the Clinton of that world, oh, yeah. right? Yeah, absolutely. And and uh, no one could touch him. He was untouchable, and he was all powerful. And that's you know even someone like Meryl Streep calling him God. You know, I mean that you know basically what she's saying was that he you know he was just. He had so much power in the business that he could get away with everything, uh, and that's good. When the god topples, it's no surprise that the whole religion starts to crumble too. So that's <laughs> that's good. But I just I fear what it will turn into, which will yes. be um, a, a monster just as bad. Sure, and you know it's Hollywood. It just really reminds me of ancient Rome, and so there's my segue. Mm-hmm. Um. <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> Well, Chronicles of the Apocalypse, Apocalypse, Apocalypse. So we had you on last time. We were talking about, uh, you know, your book, Anton's Prophecy. We were talking about the preterist argument. And this this is key to kind of understanding these two books that you have out, uh, the Chronicles of the Apocalypse. The first one is Tyrant. The second one is The Remnant. Uh, just real quick, uh, there may be some people that haven't heard that show. So what is the preterist argument? If you can encapsulate that down to <laughs> sure. a couple minutes. the Well, by the way, I think this is very relevant to conspiranormal. You know, some people might be wondering, what does this have to do with uh, the normal content? Come on, give us a good conspiracy. Well, uh, my contention would be, um, you know, with, with all due respect to uh, futurists or people who believe that last days, end times prophecies are in our future, that's the futurist view, uh, that they think the last days are in our future. Um, my contention is that they're pretty much all conspiracy theories. Um, because, you know, if you, if you look at the history of most Bible prophecy interpretation, which is this futuristic view of different, they're different kinds, sure, but no, nonetheless, they kind of have a lot of commonalities to them, you know, and I think the most generic picture is there's going to be a rapture, then there's going to be a great tribulation of seven years, and an antichrist figure who rises up to be the savior of the world, makes a covenant with Israel, rebuilds the temple, and then in three and a half years, he turns against them and kills a bunch of them, and then all hell breaks loose and judgments on the earth, and then finally, uh, uh, the Antichrist leads uh, uh, you know, an, a, a confederacy of nations, probably 10 nations, uh, upon Israel to destroy it, and then Jesus returns to destroy them all. That's sort of the, the generic picture, you know? Yeah. And and the problem is, is that if you look at the history of that, you know, even just in my own lifetime, like just, you know, look in the last 40 years, 
I, I was introduced to it all by, by Hal Lindsey was like one of the most influential ones, you know, and, uh, they're always wrong over and over and over again, always. And they're never accountable. They just keep changing every five to 10 years. They've changed all the little, you know, they, they, they go through all these detailed descriptions of this and Ezekiel matches this and going on in Russia right now. And Iran that's connected to Zechariah and this, and they're always wrong and they're always changing. And so if you look at a book 40 years ago and they'll have all the same detailed connecting the dots, I'm just connecting the dots. That's what they'll say. And, and they have the same detailed connection of Bible passages with his, with news events and they're all gone and they're all done and they're all wrong. And so that's, I, I, and so what happens is, and then you just, when the events change, you just change your conspiracy theory because there's, it's never falsifiable. You just keep believing the same thing over and over again. That from, from my perspective, now my perspective is sort of the opposite and, you know, it's because it's not the typical view. It's, it's really, you know, like really attacked and, and, uh, in many ways, uh, hated, um, because it, uh, from the futurist view, preterist view, preterist basically is Latin, a Latin word that means the past. So the preterist view basically believes that the last days, end times prophecies are mostly all in the past. And to get over the shocking nature of that is the, the way to understand that is if you, if you read the Bible prophecies, not through our modern eyes, how, how do these prophecies fit to our world? But if you say, what did they mean within their original context? You know, there's in, in Bible prophecy uses a lot of common symbols and imagery, and you, you do a study of those throughout the text and you find out what they mean. And when you do that, you realize that the, the concept of the last days is the last days of the old covenant not the last days of the world or the last days of time, right? And so when they're saying last days, they're, they don't mean it the way that the modern Christian understands it. The ancient Jew and ancient Christian understood it as everything was oriented around the old covenant, the Mosaic covenant, and the coming of Messiah. And when Messiah came, we would, we would, they would exit the Jew, ancient Jew believed they would, there was two ages, the, the present age and the age to come. And the age to come was the age of Messiah. When Messiah came, he would make it all right, right? And what they expected was this physical reality, but it was actually a spiritual kingdom. And all the things that were prophesied about Jesus came true, but they didn't come true in the way that the Jews expected. And that's why they rejected the Messiah and they killed him. And, and so the essence of preterism is this, it's saying the, the, um, Christ inaugurated the new covenant in his death, resurrection, and ascension in heaven, spiritually. But God is a God of history, and he always validates spiritual truths in history. So the old covenant was still technically standing because the, the incarnation of the old covenant, namely Jerusalem, the holy city, and the temple of God, that temple embodied all the sacrifices and all the, you know, all of Torah, right? And so God was saying, my new covenant is here, but he validated that by destroying the old covenant incarnation, which was the temple. And that was him, that was him basically saying that is done and the new covenant has arrived in Christ. But the second aspect of that is the, uh, of the destruction of the temple, which occurred in AD 70 when the armies of Titus, the Roman armies, came and destroyed, you know, it destroyed Israel and also destroyed the temple. That was the, <coughs> that was the event that occurred in AD 70. And the second element of the preterism says not only is that the destruction of the old covenant symbolized in the destruction of that old covenant incarnation temple, but – it was the final judgment by God on the first generation of Jews who were guilty of the highest crime of all history, namely murdering their own Messiah. And Jesus said this over and over again, um, you know, Matthew 23, it's like, you know, the blood of all the prophets that have died are going to be on you. Why? Because you're going to kill the Messiah. And so, so there's this judgment aspect that is going to come into all these passages as well. So it's a twofold thing. God is judging Israel for rejecting him, and and he's he's uh, bringing in the new covenant by destroying the old covenant elements and establishing that new covenant historically in that. So that's sort of my – I hope that's not too long or too much, but that's my big picture of what preterism is doing that then gives meaning to all the – you know, because I'm sure people hear this and they go, but what about this? But what about that verse? You know, and uh, – 
one of the things, one of the books I wrote, uh, End Times Bible Prophecy, is a book where I try to go through the theology of it. But you know, so I, 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 I go through, I explain some of the nature of poetry and biblical prophecy, and then I go through Matthew 24, and I show how each one of the elements of Jesus's prophecy of Matthew 24 was fulfilled in the first century and how it, what it meant. Now, that's shocking enough in itself, but I realize that one of the reasons why I wrote the novel series, uh, Chronicles of the Apocalypse, is because I really believe that the power of story to incarnate truth, whether it's theology or end times belief or whatever, or a political view, whatever, the, the power of story to incarnate, to put flesh on this abstract argument that we make, it's, it, it, it makes much better sense to people because it's sort of like, you know, if sometimes a lot of people have a hard time, uh, you know, going so deep into theology and abstraction and all that. But if you see it lived out and act out in the first century, so my Chronicles of the Apocalypse I'm telling the story in the first century around AD 60 when Nero's the emperor and the apostle John writes the book of Revelation around AD 65. So I'm telling that story in that time period and trying to show here's how they may here's how they may have seen how it all applied to them. And I think that that puts flesh on the abstract Theology, uh, eschatology, you know, and makes it entertaining. And which, by the way, my goal is not to preach a sermon and, you know, like a left behind thing. My goal is to tell a great story um, and I embed the view within it. So I think Christians can read this and appreciate and have a fascinating, uh, fresh take on Revelation. You don't have to end up agreeing with it, but you can still appreciate it and actually learn some things because my goal is, is to be historically accurate. And so I've done heavy research, and I'm following um, a famous uh, uh, Jewish historian, Josephus's Wars of the Jews. He wrote about all this event of the Jewish revolt that happened in AD 66 and how it all led to the ultimate destruction of the temple. So I'm telling that story in this whole series. And the first book that we already talked about was Tyrant, and that book focused more on Nero because I believe that Nero is ultimately the one of the beasts of revelation. And so uh, I told that story in the persecution of Christians being thrown to the lions. Again, this is historical stuff. Uh, and then now I'm I'm in, in the next book that I just released recently is called Remnant, or, uh, Rescue of the Elect. And that story, I'm, we're following a Jew, a Christian, and a Roman on a journey trying to track down the Apostle John and find the secret letter that's supposedly subversive of the Roman Empire, which is, of course, the book of Revelation. And when they find him, they realize he explains to them a little bit about what it means, and it surprises them. And so then they're in, the, in my book, Remnant, their, their goal then is to go to Jerusalem, because what they find out is, is that the book of Revelation is about this coming judgment upon Jeru on Israel and Jerusalem. And so they need to get there and tell the Christians to get out, because judgment is coming. And um, so that's the that's sort of the, the the basis of the story of Remnant, because the, in Remnant, I believe that the Jewish Christians who believed in Jesus as Messiah were God's remnant within the unbelieving nation of Israel. And God, before he's going to judge this, un, the unbelieving nation of Israel, right, and the old covenant, he has to get, he wants to get the Christians out of the city so they're not, they don't fall under the same wrath that God has for the rest of Israel. That's why the Christian believer, Jew, believing Jews are ultimately the remnant. They are the 144,000 that the book of Revelation talks about. And of course, we can go into particular details, but that's sort of the, the general story that I'm telling. And it's borne out by history because, you know, the, most scholars look at the, uh, the destruction of the temple as being that that's like the real kind of split uh, yeah. Because the Christians go their own way at that point, and uh, Judaism goes its own way. So they kind of look at that, that that's the real split there. I, I think where the confusion comes in for most people, and I, like I could kind of – somebody probably listening to this is saying, well, wait a minute. Wasn't uh, Revelation written in AD 90? Because it's generally the the uh, the date that's given. Um, but – there, there is some proof that he was probably written a lot earlier than that. Yeah, that's um, that's one of the things where you have to realize that there are many viewpoints 
um, of really just about every, you know, there's, you know, there's several major schools of interpretation and look, revelation, I don't think any scholar agrees. <laughs> they, sure. if you read the commentaries, it seems like they disagree on everything, but there it's are a very controversial book. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and it's funny because that whole thing about when he wrote it, I would admit that that is a very important thing. Cause if he wrote it after the destruction of the temple, then it, why, how could it be prophesying that? Right. But there, and, and you know, a majority of scholars do believe that, but I believe they believe it for very bi biased reasons that people need to, people need to look into that to, to, to realize, cause there are plenty of you know, awesome scholars who believe in an early date where that it was written around in the sixties sometime. And, uh, so there's plenty of evidence for that without going into the spe specific details of it. Uh, you know, as a, as a Christian who tend, I tend to value historical sources, but don't we as Christians place the Bible as a higher authority than, uh, other sources, even other Christian writings. Right. And so, uh, even if there are some Christians who may have thought even in the ancient world may have thought that it was written later, if the, if the book of revelation itself contains strong evidences that it was written before the temple, uh, you know, that, or, or that it was written, uh, in, in a certain time period, I think that that trumps, uh, other, Christian sources that may have been wrong because they could be wrong, but the Bible isn't wrong, right? And so there is, there are cases in the script in Revelation that really strongly indicate that um, you know it was written in that first century. Just a couple of quick quickies is number one is the very first verse, and you know this is a strong argument because if you think about it, the very first verse, if it tells you, it, it, first few few paragraphs tend to tell you what it's all about, right, and what's the purpose of it, and. And the very first first verse says, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave to him to show to his servants the things that must soon take place, for the time is near. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm sorry, but, you know, clearly he's writing in the first century and they're saying these, these things must soon take place. And the interesting thing is that language is peppered throughout the whole book of Revelation. I'm coming soon. These things are going to soon take place. The, he's near. He's at the door. And then at the very ending, he wraps it up again and says, for I'm coming soon and these things will soon take place. You know, to sit there and, and try to somehow symbolize that into something that means thousands of years, it, it just doesn't, it just doesn't work. It doesn't fit. He wouldn't be talking like that if he was, because there were definitely ways of describing, uh, let me, let me give you an example. This is a really, this is a really great, great example. Um, the, uh, <clears throat> the, um, in, if you look at revelation 22, 20, which I'm getting there, um, oops, I'm sorry. Revelation, was I right? 22? Yeah. Oh, it didn't go there. Okay. Uh, 22, 20. No, I was wrong. There it is. All right. So here's what he says. He goes, do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this, of this book for the time is near. But if you look at that phrase, do not seal up the words it's very, very fascinating because most everyone agrees that John draws a lot from Daniel, and we all know about the Daniel's prophecies about the end of days, right? And if you go back to Daniel 12, verse 4, it says, the angel's talking to Daniel, and what does he say? He says, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. And interestingly enough, if I can find this, Daniel 8... I think it's Daniel 826. Let's see if that's the right Yeah, and verse. I did have a question yeah. for you about Daniel as well. He goes, but... he goes, the seal in Daniel 826, he says, seal up the vision. So you seal it up. Why? For it refers to many days from now. So we see, and of course, that Daniel, that was, you know, uh, 700 years earlier, right? So we see clearly that if a prophecy is going to happen, you know, hundreds of years or even thousands of years, he says, seal up the vision. But to John, he's saying the exact opposite. He's saying, do not seal them up. Why? For the time is near. Yeah. So clearly you cannot, within the text itself, you can't conclude that these prophecies are going to happen thousands of years later, which is where we're at now, right? Uh, there are lots of other examples, but I just want to make one other really cool one that will, will be fascinating to people. And that is, um, <clears throat> there's also, there are other markers that indicate, you know, it's, it's written in this first century, particularly before the destruction. One of my favorites is in Revelation 17. 
And he's talking about the beast and the seven heads and all that, right? And in, in Revelation 17, uh, verse 9 uh, nine through twelve, it's he's he's describing. He steps out of the vision and he says, "Okay, this is what the this is what the symbols mean, right? The seven headed dragon. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman is seated, and most scholars agree that that's Rome. Rome was considered the city on seven hills of the seven mountains. Um, the question is, but which Rome was it? Ancient Rome or a future Rome, right? And then he says they are also these seven heads also represent seven kings." Thought, and by the way, the word king in, in the Jewish mindset, that could re, that references a ruler. It could be a pro, uh, it could be a, a, a prefect, it could be a governor, it could be a Caesar. The word Caesar actually meant king to them. And they, they, and they called Caesar king, right? So there are seven kings, five of whom have fallen. One is, or one now is, the other has not yet come. And when he comes, he'll only remain a little while. So here we have a phrase where John is explaining it to us, and he's telling right now at the time that I'm explaining this to you, there are seven kings, five have fallen, which I take it to mean dead, and one is. Well, if you look at the the chronology of the Caesars of Rome, which who are is the kings from Suetonius, of Rome, yeah, right. Suetonius talks about this. Um, you go through the kings, you know, starts with Julius and Augustus and on and on. And guess, so he says five have fallen, one is. So the sixth one now is. Who was the sixth Caesar of Rome? Nero. Right during that same exact time period that John exists. And it's interesting that the phrase right after that, the other has not yet come. And when he does, he must remain a little while. So that's a future prophecy. And guess what happened when Nero, when Nero killed himself, um, the, the uh, Caesar that temporarily took over was Galba. And guess what? Galba lasted a little while. He only was like a few months, or I think six months. That was a year where they had three emperors who who came and went really quickly. But the one right after Nero, the point is, is he only lasted a little while. So there's a, a very strong internal indicator in the biblical text itself that places it in that first century and probably during Nero's reign. Hmm. That is very compelling. And I saw that, I saw that in one of your footnotes that I, which by the way, you're the only fiction writer I know of that puts foot, footnotes in his fiction, but <laughs> yeah. And it's important to bring, point that out because I, when I wrote this, I knew, cause look, I know a lot of people don't, it's, it's a minority view, but, um, a lot of Christians who would be so, were so accustomed to just understanding the last days in this one way that it's so shocking when we hear it, that I knew people would read this and go, what is he making this up? Where did he get that? Right. And so I wanted to have an entertaining story, but I, I wanted to provide the encouragement for those who want to go deeper. So I footnoted and noted the all my novels I'm doing it in this series so that you can look up the details. And I'm not just like citing sources. I'm actually cutting chunks so you can literally get the, the argument and the debate through scholarly um, things for each of these things that I'm I'm showing that take place in the story. So, you know, so for example, I ha I talk about Nero and I show what he was like and and then I show how he acts and behaves and you see that it, it's very similar to the way the beast is described and things like that, you know. So um, the the other element that I think is really, really crucial, which reinforces my notion that I was saying earlier about the judgment, the purpose of Revelation is to, to foretell the destruction of the temple, which includes the elimination of the old covenant and the new and the judgment on the Jews who rejected him. If you go to Revelation verse one or chapter one, verse seven, again, this is in the beginning. He's telling us this is the theme of the book. This is the purpose. Verse seven, behold, he's coming with the clouds. Oh, there's that, there's that reference. Every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, because we have TV. Just kidding. Uh, that's what most <laughs> people think. Well, oh, every yeah. eye can see him only if there's TV. You know, that's ridiculous. But then he says this, and all the tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. Now, this, this is why I think Revelation is so often so easily misunderstood, because there, I actually think this is a bad translation. If you look, so the key phrase here is all the tribes of the earth will mourn, right? So it's like, well, he's judging the earth, isn't he? Well, where John got that verse from is actually out of uh, Zechariah. Oh, let's see here. Let me 
There it is, Zechariah 12, verse 10. And if you go, I won't go into the details, but if you go back there, he's quoting that earth. All the tribes of the earth, that word earth in Greek and in Hebrew is better translated land. And the problem is, is the people, this is where bias of theology comes into, even into translations. The people who are translating Revelation have this futuristic premillennial bias. So when they see the Greek word for, which is gay, um, which is often translated land, uh, they'll translate it as earth because of their bias. But in reality, Zechariah 12.10 is not talking about tribes of the earth. It's talking about the tribes of Israel, the tribes of the land. Of the land. When an ancient yeah. Jew heard the phrase tribes of the land, by the way, that word tribes of the land is used of Israel. That meant Israel. So now if you go through the whole book, imagine going through Revelation and changing that word earth to land you realize that this judgment is not so much about the earth, it's about the land. The land of what? Well, to the Jew, when you say the land, it was the land of Israel. They know what you're so talking this is, about. Yeah, this yeah. is one of those major misinterpretations based on bias that people don't know. But I'm not I'm not just sort of like making an argument. It's scriptural. That Zechariah verse that he's quoting, he's talking about the tribes of the land of Israel. So this revelation verse it's not tribes of the earth, it's tribes of the land of Israel. And therefore, that's the meaning and purpose of Revelation as I see it. That's another strong, you know, uh, internal evidence that shows this notion of, but but I think it, 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 you know, when you're reading and you're reading earth, earth, earth throughout Revelation, I don't blame people for thinking this is a judgment on the earth. It's not, it's judgment on the land. Sure. What's the land to a Jew? The land of Israel. Yeah, it's 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 concepts, the the different concepts for different times. You know, the yeah. way we see the Earth and the way they saw it is totally different. But you know, this goes all yeah. the way into like Heiser's material that he talks about a lot, dealing with the Old Testament. You yeah. know, just what yeah. what it meant for the people of the time. I, I wanted to ask you about because you you I took a couple of things, and you know, you mentioned Daniel. And I did have written down that I want to talk a little bit about the statue, because it does seem that the statue points to the time of Rome. Right. Uh, so you have these different, and this is something that's in even the futurist idea. You know, they they talk about this yes. a lot. Uh, but also, like in tandem with that, is the in the Book of Revelation where you know the ten horns and what that mm -hmm. means, and you bring a compelling argument through your characters in the book about yeah. what that could mean. Yeah, that's a, uh, boy, that's another big issue too. But yeah, you know, Daniel is so amazing because he sort of tells overlapping prophecies about the same thing. Like you mentioned, uh, we all know that the the four kingdoms of the statue is, you know, uh, Babylon, then the Medo-Persians, and then Greece, and then Rome. And, um, <clears throat> but those are reiterated later in what is it Daniel 7 I think it is and and those four kingdoms are referred to in new ways now it's like the lion with eagle wings and the you know the bear and then the last one that represents Rome is this bizarre beast that has iron teeth and of course Rome was known as the you know the the iron kingdom of Rome type of thing and then of course even even later in um I think it's 8 right you know uh, uh, again, another sort of, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. In eight, you got the male goat and, and that represents the, uh, the, uh, third kingdom of Greece and Alexander the great and these horns and horns are very commonly referred to as leaders or rulers within that beast. And this notion of describing human governments as beasts is, you know, because they're idolatrous, right? They're, they're, they're without God. And so they're like beasts. They're not like humans, right? And that's sort of the purpose of that. And horns are very commonly referred to as uh, rulers or powers. But the, but the thing about it is, in each of those cases, it's clearly a reiteration of, of uh, the, this historical prophecy of these four kingdoms. And it flows very naturally in history. Rome did come after Greece. But the futurists have, because of their bias that they don't believe these prophecies were fulfilled, they then, because of their preconceived theology, assume that they're there or they, they insert something that's not in the text. They insert thousands of years. So they'll say, oh yeah, the, uh, you know, the 
the um, the, the kingdoms of Babylon all the way down to Rome. But that Rome is actually a foretelling of a future Rome, not ancient Rome. So all of a sudden, they're inserting thousands of years in between those, whereas we see in history that there wasn't, it flowed right afterwards. And the other thing is, in in that statue, you see him say, in the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed, nor shall a kingdom be left to another people. When did the kingdom of God, when was that set up? Futurists tend to say, it hasn't been set up yet because Jesus hasn't returned. But no, if you read the Gospels, Jesus said the kingdom of God is at hand. It's here. He brought the kingdom. It's just a spiritual kingdom, but you're expecting a physical. And then Daniel says, it shall break in pieces all his kingdoms. And he says, just as you saw a stone was cut from a mountain by no human hand, and it broke all those other kingdoms. And then it talks about how it it becomes a mountain that fills the earth. Well, the cornerstone in the, all throughout the Old Testament was Jesus. It's Messiah. And that stone cut without hands is obviously Messiah. Messiah is the one that brings these kingdoms down, right? So again, when did Messiah come? He came in the days of ancient Rome. In other words, it all fulfills in that ancient Rome, but futurists arbitrarily insert because of their own bias. They are unwilling to take the text as it is because they have to make it fit their scenario. So they say, well, there's a, a thousand year or thousands of years in between it. It's a future Rome. It's like, no, there's no indication that that's the case at all. And it fits history too perfectly to be able to say that there's a gap, this thousands of years of gap. So so that's where another example where a lot of these prophecies are, are simply uh, spun and people don't realize the bias that they're getting uh, because, you know, they use, you know, they're clever with words and such, I think. And, and, uh, and you know, look, I, I believe they're, they're being sincere, but, um, but I still think that when you start the futurist has to keep twisting passages to make it fit because there's so much of them fit the the past tense that they have to spin it to make it fit their tense. That would be my argument. Hmm. Yeah. So uh, like this, the statue is like, what is the head, uh, the body, the feet. This is like you know, Babylon, yeah. Persia. The Greek the Empire of, yeah. of Alexander, and then down to the feet is is Rome, and so yeah, and so then the ten horns are the 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 ten armies that basically I guess destroy Judea in seventy. Yeah, and and like I said, when you understand prophecy, and I tried to do this in my book End Times Bible Prophecy, I tried to explain to people how. I, I really feel that hyperliteralism, you know, taking the Bible literally because that's what that's that's the only way to 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 give God his reverence. Well, that's completely fallacious because that is a very modernist way of reading. But if you study Old Testament prophecy and apocalyptic, it's completely full of poetry all throughout. And it's just absurd to me that people try to stress this literalism all the time. And and to say that something's symbolic and not literal, it's not to say that it doesn't refer to anything. It's just a, you know, uh, 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 I don't know what they what they they say. Well, if it's in symbolic, then it just doesn't mean anything. You know, no, that's not at all what. It, of course, a symbol refers to something in history, but you have to first understand it as a symbol. It's not it's not primarily literal. So that's why you've got all these, you know, and they can understand this with the bizarre images of beasts and monsters, but there's a lot more to it than that. And, you know, there you, you, you know, you hear about the stars and sun, moon going dark and the stars falling from the sky. Well, that's got to be literal because that's how God works. No, if you study the language of prophecy, it's very poetic, and you see that stars are symbols of earthly and heavenly powers over the nations, and whenever God judges a nation, a city, or a, or a people, uh, he describes it as a far, stars falling from the sky because he's overthrowing the powers that ex- that be, and 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 that's a very common, common thing. So I try to explain how poetic biblical prophecy is, and that doesn't mean it doesn't refer to history. It just means you have to understand symbols first. And then I then I apply it and and explain how Matthew twenty four Jesus's discourse can be fulfilled all in the first century. But but the main problem I start with is what I call 
the problem of hyperliteralism. And I think Christians have been so uh, sucked into this hyperliteralism of, uh, you know, if you don't think it's literal, then you're a liberal that doesn't believe the Bible's God's word. That's completely ridiculous. Has nothing to do. Actually, I would say, if you do not, if you do not read biblical prophecy as symbolic first, you are the liberal <laughs> because you're not reading the text as it was in, originally written and mm. intended to be read. You're imposing your own cultural bias upon the text, and that's what liberalism is. Liberalism is dom- is is replacing the 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 current worldview with your own worldview. And I say no. Find out what it meant to them in their world, and then you that to understand uh, future cases, right? So that's kind of how I approach that. Apollyon, this is interesting that you use him as the uh, antagonist of the novel series. Um, why do you choose Apollyon? Ah, yes, Apollyon. That's in he. He, we, he first shows up in Revelation nine, and that's where the uh, you know the the uh, locust demons are basically released from the pit from the abyss, and it says they have a king over them, the angel of the the abyss. His name in Hebrew is Abaddon, and in Greek he is Apollyon. Abaddon means the destroyer, and in Greek he is Apollyon. And by the way, Apollyon is a derivative of Apollos, um, which interesting was interestingly was. Um, Nero's uh, patron deity. Hmm, another interesting connection. But anyway, so there, no one's entirely sure what this Apollyon is. But there is a there is an argument that he may be uh, maybe another name for Satan. Satan. Just how you know how in the Book of Revelation Jesus is referred to one, a couple times as an angel. You know, an angel that gives this vision. You know, uh, Jesus is referred to as a lamb with seven eyes or multiple eyes, right? And so he's ref- Jesus is referred to in, in multiple different references, and, and so might Satan be. And there's a, there's a pretty good argument. It's not, you know, it's not absolute, and we, we, we don't know for sure, that maybe Apollyon is another word for Satan. Uh, so in my novel, one of the other elements of Chronicles of the, Apoc- of the Apocalypse is I wanted to not just show the historical events I wanted to try to capture that spiritual reality that we all read in Revelation, right? This, you know, this yeah, angelic spiritual warfare going on. I wanted to kind of make that come alive. So I try. I, I show what might it look like if we pull back the curtain and also saw what was going on in the spiritual realm at the same time of the historical events. Look, this is speculation. I'm not saying this is how it really was. This is just a way for me to sort of show theologically what may have been uh, happening, you know. And so, like you said, my villain is Apollyon, which I take to be Satan. But nonetheless, he is the he's kind of like the leading leading the forces of of evil, and he's got his plans as well, you know, because of course he's going to ultimately bring all the armies down and you know Armageddon and stuff. But he also releases these these demonic locusts and stuff, and um and so. And one of the one of the themes of my my biblical storytelling began with Chronicles of the Nephilim, and the premise of that was, you know, if you look, if you study the Old Testament, a lot of this is based on Michael Heiser's writings, but if you study the Old Testament, you'll see that there's this theme that goes throughout that we weren't taught as evangelicals, but it's there, Deuteronomy 32, and that is that that. In the ancient days, in the time of Babel, when God separated the the, the the nations, this is Deuteronomy 32, verses 8 through 10, it, said, it talks about how God places the nations, the Gentile nations, under the authority of what I – of the, the sons of God, and these sons of God are the divine beings. And I think – that they are the fallen sons of God who rebelled against God because they, you know, they they are worshipped as gods and and God judges them because of that. But then he says, "But I kept Jacob for myself or Israel." And so there's this notion that he places the Gentile territories and peoples under spiritual authorities, and this shows up again in Daniel a lot more clear, right? When when Daniel talks about uh, what is it? I think it's in Daniel. What is it? Eight or no ten? I think it's ten, right? Where he talks about how the prince of per- i fought against the prince of persia and the prince of greece was coming well that was describing these territorial authorities over these nations as they were warring to bring about this historical thing that daniel talked about right persia and greece right so um <clears throat> this so there's this notion that the gentile nations are under this authority and that's why they're 
dark and they, you know, they're completely cut off from God and God is only working through this single little nation. But when Messiah comes, the principle is that he will, he will bring back the nations to him, right? He will, he will, uh, you know, what does Ephesians say? It says, when Jesus ascended, he led a tra- train of victory and triumph out of in his ascension. And that phrase is a reference to the Roman triumph. In the Roman triumph, the the victor would parade the the loser, dead or alive, parade them mm. through the streets to show his glory. So Jesus is saying he took back the authority from all these Gentile nations. He whipped the butts of the, the the gods of the nations, and he took back the authority. Why? This is what it means when it says the gospel goes out into all the nations and all the nations, Gentiles are now coming into the kingdom because they're no longer under that sort of demonic oppression that kept them from God, right? And so now they can believe in faith and come into the kingdom along with Jews. And that was the shocking controversy of the gospel. Uh, But that's how Messiah kind of fills that picture. So I was telling that story throughout Nephilim, Chronicles of Nephilim, and I realized, oh, I'm not done yet. I got got revelation, and it still applies. So I'm trying to show how all these, these, uh, you know, territorial powers and spirits. And I don't know exactly how it looks like, but I try to show them as the various gods of the nations and how they're all sort of, um, you know, getting together to try to fight and destroy God's people. But God has different plans that they're not, they're not aware of. <clears throat> it's also an interesting concept in this, that, um, this idea of God divorcing the nation of yeah. Israel and coming to the new bride, which is the church. Yes. I found that fascinating as well. It It is very fascinating. By the way, I, this is, I got this from Ken Gentry. Listeners, keep your eyes open to a book that's going to be a game changer in Bible prophecy because in, uh, early next year, early, uh, you know, maybe January or February, hopefully, um, he's got a uh, two volume revelation commentary coming out which is partial preter it's it partial preterism it is the view that i'm using in my books he's a friend of mine i was able to get a early draft of the book so i could use it the scholarship to guide me and it's called the divorce of israel and that's what he calls the you know the book series the, the commentary on revelation because his premise is this Um, This is that element that I told you how uh, God is going to judge Israel. Well, here's the principle. The book of Revelation is about two women, the harlot and the bride. The harlot represents unfaithful Israel, which, you know, the the Old Testament prophets called Israel a harlot all the time, right? Why? Because she was unfaithful because she didn't worship Yahweh. They kept worshiping Baal and the Asherahs, right? But in this case, they it, it it wasn't they worship bailing it wasn't that they're worshiping Baal it was that they murdered the Messiah so their un, spiritual unfaithfulness to God casts Israel as the harlot their apostate and and God is following His law because when a husband had a wife who would become unfaithful what did it say he could do he could execute her he could divorce her and have her executed for adultery. So, and but but you couldn't execute someone without two witnesses, right? So you see, read through the book of Revelation. And again, this is the big picture sweep, but it gives meaning to these little details. So God is saying, I'm divorcing Israel, the apostate Israel, but I'm staying true to my remnant who believe in Messiah. But as the, the nation and the old covenant, I'm divorcing her and I'm going to execute her, which is the destruction of the temple and of the land and putting them all into slavery and 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 such which is what happened and the, another diaspora and and I'm going to have two witnesses to 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 prove and the two witnesses in revelation 11 you know there's different interpretations but I think you know I think that they whether they're literal two witnesses or not they still symbolize the law and the prophets, Elijah and Moses, the law and the prophets, because the law and the prophets judged Israel because they didn't obey the law and the prophets by believing in Messiah. And then when, but God would never marry another bride until uh, he's divorced the old one. And then by, by the time you get to, you know, Revelation 20, what do you, what do you hear? Or I'm sorry, Revelation 21, you hear 
a new heaven and new earth, a holy city, the bride of Christ. So this is another thing where people automatically assume, oh, new heavens and new earth, that's got to be the end of the world. No, there's a whole nother way of understanding the new heavens and new earth is first and foremost, a covenantal imagery of the new covenant. It's an expression of the new covenant. You go back into Isaiah 66, and that's what you see. You see a description of the new covenant with judgment on Israel. Now, in Revelation itself, it says it's a symbol. It's not literal in this particular case. I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. That's in verse 2. Then he reiterates the same thing down in verse 9, and he says, I will show you, come, I will, I will show you the bride, the wife of the lamb. He carried me away in the spirit to a great high mountain and showed me what? The holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven. So he clearly says this whole new city, Jerusalem, it's not literal. It's symbolic. It's symbolic of what? The bride, the wife of the lamb. What is that in the New Testament? Can anyone deny? All, I, look, I don't have the scriptures at my at my fingertip here, but obviously the body of Christ, we are his bride. <laughs> we are the ones who marry the lamb. And so he's describing this marriage to his own people because, and what are his own people now? There are this, this believing Jews melded with believing Gentiles, which is a complete new entity in, in a sense, but really it's the true entity all along of God's people. And so this is where you get this notion of the divorce of the old covenant Israel as and and the marriage to the new bride, which is the new covenant. Now, this all began at the death, resurrection, and ascension of Christ, no doubt, truly. The new covenant was, inst- was inaugurated, and it was legitimate. But like I said, God, look throughout the Old Testament, God always – always validates historically what he's doing spiritually, even with Christ, right? He said, you know, my, my miracles are to show to you that I'm the one who I said, I'm the coming Messiah. Believe me and because of the miracles, you know? And so God validates himself uh, historically. Uh, and that's why the, the purpose of Revelation is, it's like saying the new covenant was inaugurated in Christ, but then 40 years later, one generation, Jesus said, all these things will happen on this generation, so within one generation, it was finalized, vindicated, and consummated the new covenant, right, in the destruction of the old covenant elements. So that's sort of the big, that's that's that picture that's going on. I hope we're not becoming too abstract. Here I am talking about the power of great story, and we're focusing on the <laughs> theology. But my goal is, is, so I'm telling this story, you know, and the story is, you know, like I say, I'm, I'm following this Jew and a, a, a Christian who's a servant, and the Jew are basically following this Roman prefect who's who's given this task from Nero himself to track down this book. But of course, you know, by the time the, the they they discover what it is, the Roman now realizes that this is no danger to Nero. Nero thought this this guy was a you know plotting assassination of him, but it's not. It's something different. And so there's a change of mind that goes on with him. But through that, we get to see, we take a journey through the seven cities of Revelation. You know, they, they don't go to all the cities, but they go to Ephesus. And so we see a little bit about what's going on in each of those seven cities spiritually that matches the book of Revelation. We see the spiritual warfare that's going on. And then we follow these guys. They go to Patmos and find John, and then they end up going to Jerusalem. And here's what happens is the, the uh, Jewish revolt against Rome began around AD 66. And in, Re- in Remnant, I, I tell that story about that revolt rising up. And a lot of these Jews thought that, so now keep in mind, they didn't believe Jesus was the Messiah, but they did believe that the Messiah was about to come right, right. there to, re- to free them from Rome. Right. And even Josephus did. And they even said, Daniel proved it. Da- Daniel shows that it's supposed to be happening right around now. So some of them even thought that they were Messiah, right? Because they were military, you know, and so there's all these rebels and little rebel armies. And it's like a civil war going on at the same time that the, that Nero sends Titus and, and Vespasian and the, and the Roman armies. And so I'm telling this story. Meanwhile, these Christians are in Jerusalem. The Roman armies are coming down upon them and they got to convince the Christians to leave. And the problem is the Christians there are infected by the Old Testament Judaism and they don't quite believe them. 
So are they going to get them out in time or not? You know, that's the thing. And, and that's the question that, that they ask. But this is just the beginning because this is only book two. There's still two more books to go. So there's a lot more to tell of this story. But I wanted to, I wanted to give it through the eyes of how a Roman might see what's going on, how a Jew might see it, and how a Christian might see it, and sort of integrate all those views into these different characters. And meanwhile, have these angelic warfare going on. And, and there's even a, there's even some angels that end up helping out the Christians and they don't know that they're angels, you know? So it's kind of a cool, and, and I have warfare going on and I, I deal with a lot of moral issues. Like, were there, were there some Christians who fought back, you know? Cause I mean, were they pacifists or did some of them fight back, you know? And what was their premise for that? When, when these Jewish wars were coming up, right? Did the Christians just go and hide or did maybe some of them wanted to protect their the other Christians and, and how would, what would that look like, you know? So I take us through that journey through the land and through all the various cities in Israel to give you a feel for it. And then they finally end up in Jerusalem and that's where the big, the big battle showdown is coming, but it's not quite there yet. And that's what, uh, that's the, uh, the cliffhanger. Like the one hundred forty-four thousand. Now that's a that's mm-hmm. a symbolic number. Yeah. But that 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 denotes that remnant that's left of, I guess, Jewish Christians. Yeah. So you know, this is the you know who are the one hundred forty-four thousand and all that and and look, uh, I, I think it's pretty self self explanatory, self uh, self evident. That 144,000 is symbolic number. I don't think it's literal because, of course, it's 12 apostles times 12, um, uh, 12 tribes, right? That's the new times a thousand. And the thousand in scripture tends to be a, a number that means perfect completion. In other words, God's going to wrap it up and this will be his complete. Uh, in this case, is his complete number that he wants to save, and it seals them from every tribe of the sons of Israel. So this is the fulfill. This is what he's saying: is the Jews began at Pentecost, right? The whole point of Pentecost was showing how there are men from every nation, all the tribes of Israel, and and from all the nations, the Gentiles as well, Gentile nations that is, who c- came to Israel and got saved, and that that was a sort of the fulfillment, the beginning of the fulfillment of God bringing in. Christ, uh, Jews from the 12 tribes and saving them. And so, uh, these are the, tw- these 144,000, you know, even if you think it's a literal, go ahead, that's fine. I don't care. But I think it's just symbolic of the fact that these are the Jews who believed in Messiah. Would they not believe in Messiah? Of course they believe in Messiah. God, you know, you can't say that they're Jews who don't. So these were the ones who believed in Jesus and they're the ones that God protected. And lo- and, and by the way, this, this is all connected to Matthew 24, classic, you know, classic verse that people always talk about. When you see the abomination of desolation, this is Matthew 24, verse 15. When you see the abomination of desolation spoken by Daniel standing in a holy place, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let not the one who's on the house stop, not go down to take one who's house. Just flee, get out of there quickly. Well, that all, that, excuse me, that all makes sense in that time period because if you look at um, Luke 21, 20, it's the same, he's getting the same sermon and Luke is sort of written to Greeks mostly, I think. And he explains the Jewish imagery. What is the abomination of desolation? A Greek wouldn't necessarily know that, right? So if you read uh, Luke, Luke um, 21, 20, he literally says, when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, know that the time is near and flee to the mountains. So he's basically telling us the abomination of desolation in the Gospels is defined for us as being Jerusalem surrounded by armies. And those are pagan armies. That's why they're abominations of desolation. They're going to bring desolation to the temple. And lo and behold, you know, Eusebius, a famous church father, tells us that the Christians did flee and they went to the mountain town of Pella. And Pella was one of the towns that was completely destroyed by the civil war that was going on between Jews and Greeks. In Israel, Jews were rising up and there was always animosity between the Greeks. And, um, and of course, some the Greek cities of the Decapolis were mostly Greek and Pella was part of that. And so sometimes the Greeks would slaughter thousands of Jews in a city. All this was, this was going on in this time period. And then sometimes Jews would slaughter the Greeks, right? But in the case of Pella, it was like destroyed. And they think that maybe even was, uh, 
you know, like no one was almost living there. So there's lots of room for the Christians to be able to go and, and live there. And and so this kind of, this stuff really did happen and it happened back then and it, and it fits. And they saw it related to, to their own world. I mean, listen, if you're in modern Jew, modern Israel and you flee to the mountains, you're not going to be protected. <laughs> You know, in the modern world, there's no protection just fleeing to the mountains. You're not, you're not safe. But in that first century, it was because you're, it was a mountain city that was out of the way and, and the Romans didn't necessarily hit all the cities and they didn't go after the cities that were already destroyed by the civil war. See, so it makes sense in their context, but it doesn't make sense in our context because all this stuff about if you're in the field, don't turn back and get your cloak. This is all first century imagery that made sense, but it, it's not what's going on nowadays, right? Sure. Yeah, that, that does make sense. Oh, here's, here's another cool thing too. Matthew 24, verse 21. For then there will be great tribulation such as not been from the beginning of the world until now, no, no, ever be. So this, the great tribulation, that's what everyone talks about. That. The, the tribulation, the tribulation, it's seven years and all this stuff. There's never anywhere where it talks about seven years of a great tribulation. Um, but uh, nonetheless, there's this great tribulation. Well, it, is that is that in our future? Well, it must be because there, it says that there's such has not been from the beginning of the world until the end. Well, that's hyperbolic language, which also has precedent in the Old Testament. They use that same language about such has never been happened from the beginning until now, nor it never will be. And guess the, what language they used it of? They used it of the Babylonian destruction of the temple back in 580, 538 BC, I think it was, or, or whatever, something like that. But here's the cool thing. So we're in, when's this great tribulation? And that's what I'm telling in my book. I'm, I'm describing, this is what the tribulation looked like. So I'm, I'm showing the Christians being, you know, thrown to the lions, being crucified and all this kind of stuff. Well, Revelation 1, this is one of my favorite it's just there's it's amazing how many explicit things are in the Bible that Christians miss. When's the tribulation? Well, guess what? Revelation 1 verse 9. John says, "I John, your brother and partner in the tribulation was on the island of Patmos, right? So John's literally saying as he's writing a book, he is going through the tribulation with them. So the tribulation was already going on in the days of John, the tri the tribulation, the one that they were looking forward to. So, you know, again, that's another explicit statement that it's amazing how Christians just wipe in and say, oh, no, that's just general tribulation, a tribulation. No, it says the whole tribulation, ho in Greek. You know, that means the, the, the uh, what is it? The, um, I, don't, I forgot what they call it, the, the pre- Ah, I'm not good with the grammar. I'm not a Greek grammar guy, but it's it's the it's the notion of saying this is a, a specific tribulation. It's not generic tribulation. So you know, then there's lots more of these little amazing explicit statements that just seem to say this is all going on in that first century, and that's the story I want to tell. I want to show that tribulation and what it might look like. Rather, it's not just this sort of you know um, abstract theology, but it actually took place. Yeah, I think that this view is gaining ground, this this kind of preterist view. It is. Because there's, it there's really a is. lot of it that just, I mean, I'm, I, like I said, I'm not completely convinced, but there's a lot of it that makes sense. Yeah, you know, I've seen it just within my the last 20 years, you know, I sort of came into it about 20 years ago or so, and and at that time, boy, it was like shocking. I I, I wouldn't tell anybody, but now, and, and nobody would know about it. I would start talking about it. They go, what? I've never heard that before. Yeah. Now there's still a lot of people who don't really know it. In fact, I, I honestly, I have never, I really haven't yet read someone critiquing preterism who, who, who described it accurately. They, they don't know what it really is, but at least they try. And, and a lot now people, a lot more people are aware of it, but I do think I'm amazed when I'm interacting with people on Facebook, how many people are like, yeah, great, Brian, I'm partial predators too. And, and I, I'm just surprised at how many are, are in the camp. And I, I think that it's growing. And I think they're, they're having the same experience that I had, which was this, you know, when you keep seeing these predictions of Christian Bible prophecy pundits wrong over and over and over again, you start to think maybe the problem is not with the individuals being wrong, 
but it's the problem with the system itself. And maybe I should consider other systems that might have a better way of describing things, at least consider them. You know, you owe it to yourself to at least read the various viewpoints, which I hardly, I hardly recommend getting those like four view, four view books or something like that, you know, and, and listen to, to the guys interact with from the various viewpoints and start to say, you know, which, which has a little bit, you know, which of these has something that, that makes a little bit more sense and explore that deeper. And, and I think people are seeing that in preterism because these futuristic predictions are just wrong over and over and over again. Well, Brian, I think we'll leave it there. I think that's a good place <laughs> to stop. Um, there's a lot more I'd like to ask, but, uh, time constraints, I guess I'll, maybe I'll, I'll send you a, I'll send you something on Facebook or something, but feel free uh, to, yeah. Or email <laughs> me. Absolutely. Absolutely. The, um, where can people get the books and uh, people can uh, see your other works? Well, look, if, if this stuff is shocking to you and you're really curious about it, you don't want to jump in or something, but you want to find out a little bit more about what what this stuff is about, Godawa.com. That's my website, G-O-D-A-W-A.com. Everything's there. I've got all my books that I've written and you can click on – and I, I made it a very – I think a very interactive, interesting website. I provide a lot of material for people, free stuff. Uh, and I describe what's going on in the storylines and I even show pictures of the characters and I have artwork. And I also have a lot of scholarly articles uh, that are free uh, that are relevant to all the material I'm, I'm talking about. So you can really find out a little bit more if you, if you don't want to jump in. But basically all my books are in Kindle, paperback and audiobook form. All my books are, and you can get them all at Amazon. And so, uh, ultimately that's where you, that's where you can buy it. And there's also a love triangle in the second book. Yes. You know, thank you for pointing that out. I tend to be caught up in all the action stuff, but, uh, I'm actually proud of the fact that I have this, um, a love story going on. And I, I, I intend, by the way, I intend to, to take it to, to the end of the book. And it is my major, the, the love relationship is my major focus of characters, my main characters, my two main characters are that. And they're going to go through a lot, a lot of up and down problems and issues. Um, but I'm, I'm really kind of proud of that because I think it's important to have that element. You know, in, in other words, uh, love and marriage and such is, you know, it's very much a a representation, a symbol of God's love for us, as well as, you know, the beauty and hope. Because after all, what does he talk about? He talks about the wedding feast of the lamb, which is that kingdom of God that we're all about. And so I, I try to folk, I try to make the, this, 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 uh, love relationship be a, a crucial, uh, part of the plot. Excellent. Well, Brad, stay on the line for us. Uh, we are going to close out this section and guys, we'll be back to Close out the show. I'll get spirit on it. Bob is about to pass out. Uh, yes. So we are going to close out this show because I can't have a sleeping producer on my hands. Uh, that's Luke's job. That's yeah. I that, will not take it. Right. The co-host is the one that usually sleeps. So, um, any thoughts? Um, I didn't understand most of it. I tried. <laughs> you did understand. Or I did not. You, you did not okay. most of it. Yeah, it's uh, a lot of that stuff is kind of hard to wrap your wrap your brain about. I mean, it's it's interesting what he's doing, you know, um, coming up with this fictional story tied around um, all uh, you know the biblical events and all that, and not knowing the biblical events enough to follow how the fictional stuff ties in. It was made it tricky for me, but I, I do. I mean, I you know I commend him. It's a, it's a really cool yeah. thing that he's. I, I I think it's fascinating. I I, I really do. I, like I said, I'm not like quite there yet for to the preterist view because I still think there's some questions that I have. But it is pretty. It does seem to kind of match up to what happened in in actual history. And I think like most Christians on this planet really wouldn't have a problem with it. 
I think it's really the few people like the the dispensationalists and futurists, which is mostly kind of like your more evangelical Christian uh, <laughs> well, worldview. Like I don't think the, fear. You take yeah, that fear away, then I don't think the Lutheran, like the Lutherans, for instance, I don't think they'd have a problem with it. I don't think the Episcopalians would have a problem with it. I don't think the Greek Orthodox would have a problem with it, or the Roman Catholic. So I'll just state that, you know. But I, you know, it's it's interesting to entertain it. Um, so I really want to thank Brian for coming on, and I want to thank Jason Fabuck for coming on. That was a really that was really cool to speak to him. Uh, he was really into. He really loves the show. And, yeah, it's always cool to when people reach out to us like that. Yeah, and it's it, it's uh, really cool that somebody that writes for that uh, not writes but draws for DC Comics um, listens to our show. I think that's really really great. So uh, we will leave it there. Um, we do still have the Patreon up. Uh, Rob, you can tell people where to where to get that. Yeah, go to patreon.com slash conspiranormal. We got quite a few bonus episodes up there now. We still got t-shirts if you want to jump into that tier. Um, but there's several different different uh, levels you can contribute there. And if you want to just do a one-time con- uh, contribution, you can go to our website. That's uh, www.conspiranormal.com. And if you don't want to go there because you don't have the extra money, we understand. But a nice, quick five-star review on iTunes means a lot to us as well. Hey, absolutely. Um, next time, I'm not going to say who's coming on. I want to leave it. To, leave it. You know who it is. Oh, that's right. But uh, I want to leave that uh, as a surprise for when we drop that show. Needless to say, this is something that I'm someone that uh, I'm very excited I forgot who it is. I'm kind of excited now. Very excited (laughs) about uh, interviewing. I'll just leave it at that. So, guys, thank you so much. And we will be back next time on Conspiranormal. Go to bed. Go to bed, Rob. Okay.